you. You may all be seated. Court is back in session on the People versus Larry Nasser, and we are in the midst of victim statements. Victim survivor. Survivor victim. However it goes, we are all survivors. Next. Just, just to update the court, um, I did let your staff know that since we broke last night, we've had three additional survivors um, express an interest in speaking, so we've added them in our schedule. So we're up to 101 right now. And I have received their statements and added them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judge, um, the first survivor today is um, Maggie Nichols. Her mother, Gina Nichols, will speak on her behalf. She has authorized um, to be identified publicly. And I do have a photograph of Ms. Nichols. Um, she is a former National United States Gymnastics team member. Ma'am, could you please tell us her name? I, I will. My name is Gina Nichols, and I'm the mother of Maggie Nichols. And could you spell both names, please? Sure. Your and your daughters. Yep. Um, Maggie is M-A-G-G-I-E, and I'm Gina. I'm G-I-N-A. N-I-C-H-O-L-S. Correct. Thank you. For the record, I know we see it up there, and we've spoken it, but for the record, we always spell it, too. So Isn't she beautiful? She is gorgeous. Absolutely. Thank you. Perfect. Should I go ahead? You may proceed, ma'am. Okay. Um, Maggie did not want to be here today. This is, it's too painful. Um, she did become public uh, as of last week. And um, although she did report her abuse in 2015 to USA Gymnastics, she just became public last week. Um, and this is really difficult for her because she is a full-time student and she's training as a full-time athlete still for the University of Oklahoma. So to go have to deal with coming public and all the pressure of what's happening with her, um, this would, it was just too much. So I'm gonna read um, the statement from that she put out to the public. Everybody probably already read it, but I'm gonna read it again because she didn't wanna add anything to that. And then I have a few things as a parent and a mother I'd like to say. Of course, you are welcome. You may proceed when you're ready. Okay. Recently, three of my former national team members who medaled in the 2012 Olympics, and now uh, another one because Simone Biles, her very best friend, became public the other day as well, um, have bravely stepped forward to proclaim they were sexually assaulted by USA team, uh, I'm not gonna say doctor, Larry Nassar, by Larry Nassar. Today, I join them. I am making the decision to tell my traumatic story and hope to join the forces of my friends and teammates to bring about true change. Up until now, I was identified as Athlete A by USA Gymnastics, the United States Olympic Committee and Michigan State University. And I want everyone to know that he did not do this to Athlete A, he did it to Maggie Nichols. In the summer of 2015, my coach and I reported this abuse to USA Gymnastics leadership. I first started gymnastics when I was three, and since I was a child, I always had the dream of competing for my country in the Olympic Games. I made elite level when I was 13 years old, and by the time I was 14, I was on the USA national team. I traveled internationally for four plus years, attending competitions all over the world representing our country. And in 2015, I competed at the World Championships representing our country once again. People who watch gymnastics see girls fly through the air and do all kinds of amazing things. And you can imagine that having a good doctor is absolutely necessary to compete at the highest levels. Dr. Larry Nassar was regarded as throughout the sport as the very best by coaches and staff throughout the gymnastics community. The first time I met Dr. Larry Nassar, I was about 13 or 14 years old and I was retreat, re receiving treatment for an elbow injury. And at the time, it seemed like he knew exactly what he was doing with the therapy he gave me. Initially, he did nothing unusual. But when I was 15 and I started to have back problems while at the national team training camp at the Crowley Ranch, this is when things changed in the medication er, in the medical treatments that occurred. My back was really hurting me and I couldn't even bend down. And I remember he took me into the training room, closed the door, locked it, closed the blinds, 
And at the time I thought this was kind of weird, but figured it must be okay. I thought he probably didn't want to distract the other girls and I trusted him. I trusted what he was doing at first, but then he started touching me in places I really didn't think he should. He didn't have gloves on. He didn't have gloves on. He didn't tell me what he was doing and there was no one else in the room. And I accepted what he was doing because I was told by the, uh, the adults in charge at the USA Olympic Training Center that I should receive help from him. He did this treatment, quote unquote, on me, maybe five or six or multiple times. Not only was Larry Nasser my doctor, I thought he was my friend. He contacted me on Facebook, complimenting and telling me how beautiful I was, looking at, uh, looking and contacting me on numerous occasions. But I was only 15 and I thought he was just trying to be nice to me. Now I believe this was all part of the grooming process that I've learned about. One day at practice, I was talking to my teammate, who everybody knows now to be Allie Braceman, and brought up Dr. Nassar and his treatments. When I was talking to her, my coach overheard, and I had never told another coach, I had never told my coach about these treatments, and after hearing her conversation, she asked me more questions about it and said, it doesn't seem right, doesn't seem right at all. I showed her the Facebook messages and told her that what Nassar was doing, my coach thought it was very, very wrong, so she did the right thing and reported it immediately to USA Gymnastics. Ma'am, could you just slow down a little bit? Okay. As you're reading. Okay. Thank you. USA Gymnastics and the United States Olympic Committee did not provide a safe environment for me and my teammates and friends to train. We were subjected to Dr. Larry Nassar at every national team training camp, which occurred monthly at the Crowley Ranch. His job was to care for our health and our injuries, and instead he violated our innocence. I have come to the realization that my voice now can, can be heard and have influence over the manner in which our USA athletes are treated. Throughout everything that has happened, my faith in God has sustained me. I would like everyone to know that I'm doing okay. My strong faith has helped me endure. It is a work in progress and I will strive to ensure the safety of young athletes who have big dreams, just like mine, and I'll encourage them to stand up and speak out if something doesn't seem right. I want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart that have helped me through this difficult time, my parents, coaches, and friends who have known, and that have stood by my side. I would not have been here or been able to get through this and be this strong without each and every one of you. Now that's the statement that she had put out when she came public last week. And then I just have a little bit more to say as a parent. You may. As a parent and a, a healthcare professional. I've been a registered nurse for 35 years and my husband, by the way, is a doctor. And you know what my husband is? A real doctor. A real doctor that, that treats children and helps them to get better, not to hurt them, like you have to hundreds of people. You disgraced yourself by calling yourself a doctor to the medical community. A real doctor never sees a child alone in a room. It does procedures on them. A real doctor has an adult present when working with a child. A real doctor gets parental consent. A real doctor never under any circumstances would to touch a child in, in their genital or anal area. A real doctor, if he would need to be in private parts, would wear gloves. A real doctor would explain every single thing he is doing to the child with their, uh, their the, the parent or an adult with them. A real doctor, as I said before, helps heal. He doesn't hurt. You actually are not a real doctor. You're not a doctor at all. You're a serial child molester, a pedophile.
My husband is a real doctor. He has never done the procedure to a child in his entire career. Funny, the procedure that you were doing to all these children, nobody else seems to do. My husband has taken care of all the same injuries that all these athletes that you have taken care of and has never once had to do any form of procedure on them. And guess what? They all got better. They all got better. They didn't need your procedure. There's no such thing as your procedure. My daughter was at the Olympic Training Center one week a month for years. We sent a child across the country to train, to try and make, to be on the USA team and represent our country, a child. And she was not protected whatsoever. Multiple people failed her. We never once by Larry Nassar, when apparently he was seeing and treating all these children, which most of them were children under the age of 18. We never once got a phone call from him at our hometown of Minnesota to let us know that he needed to do a procedure, meaning could we, could I get, give, get consent over the phone? We never gave him parental consent. She was alone with you in exam rooms and didn't understand what you were doing. And you didn't even wear gloves. Gross. You put your fingers in people's vaginas and rectums with no gloves? That's gross. It's disgusting. Nobody does that. Lastly, shame on MSU, USAG, and the United States Olympic Committee for this gross, inexcusable negligence for allowing this pedophile to flourish for this long and for all of these poor victims to be abused. They and every one of the people who enabled this are responsible for this. It wasn't just Larry, it was all the people, all the people, including USA Gymnastics. And I see that you're representing them there. They are accountable. They are accountable. And I don't want to hear any more statements from everybody else. We're, we're, we're doing this and we're doing that. We have a safer place now. It's too late now. That's fine. We need to make a safer place. But all the people at US, USAG and MSU and United States Olympic Committee who covered it up and allowed this negligence and abuse to happen to children are responsible. And they have to take responsibility for it. Ma'am, I want you to know that you have been heard. By being in this court, it's not just that your words are forever on this record and in front of me in consideration for sentencing, but really the world is watching. You have been heard. I want Maggie to know that you represented her very, very well here. I also want her to know that Maggie represented the USA very well today with her words and for all other athletes because we cannot undo what happened. We can't make it better, but we can have a better future for our children and your voices are so important in that. Nasser was not the very best doctor, he was the very best liar. And that is ringing through in every victim's statement. And I want you to know that that has also been heard. He didn't just violate Maggie's innocence and all of your trust, but he robbed her of that and her childhood. And I recognize that. I also want you to be assured that this defendant will have a real sentence behind bars where he can do no more harm. And I want to thank you for your loud voice on behalf of your daughter, your family, and all of the survivor victims. Thank, thank you. you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.
during her time as an MSU student athlete. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Could you please, before you begin, state and spell your name for the record? My name is Tiffany Thomas Lopez, and it's spelled T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-T-H-O-M-A-S-L-O-P-E-Z. Thank you so much. What would you like me to know? I ever had the opportunity to see you again. Instead, I'll allow my thoughts and my feelings to hit your heart. You and your actions have walked with me every step of the way since leaving Michigan State University. Such a beautiful campus tarnished with your touch. Not only did you take away an amazing opportunity that I had playing for a Division I college, I was also selected to play on the 1999 USA Junior National Softball Team in Taipei, Taiwan. As exciting of an experience as it was, my most memorable moment was sitting around a box of pizza with teammates, debating if I should ask them if they had ever experienced treatment like I had. Your actions not only consumed my thoughts, but distracted me from moments I can never live again. Every few years, I wondered if there was another Tiffany Thomas who sought treatment on the tables of the Duffy or Jenison training room. Would you ask her what was the matter as she lay there sobbing because she felt violated? But to my surprise, I'd find pictures of you smiling and enjoying life. I was hurt and disappointed, but also extremely relieved knowing it was only me and I accepted this as something I would live with forever. Since you've decided to tell the truth about sexually assaulting an army of young women, I'm choosing to stand tall with them and fight back. The army you chose in the late 90s to silence me, to dismiss me, and my attempt at speaking the truth will not prevail over the army you created when violating us. We seek justice, we deserve justice, and we will have it. I have decided to start living again. Your actions have had me by the throat for years, and I am ready to be released by your clench. I will no longer fear speaking up for myself. I will no longer fear speaking up for my children. I will stand my ground to those in authoritative positions, and most importantly, I will try not to be hesitant toward male medical professionals. I will try to forgive you of your wrongdoing and allow my heart to heal. Lastly, I'd like to thank the court for allowing me an opportunity to speak my thoughts and heal my heart. That was absolutely beautiful, just as you are. I'm so proud of you for being here today. And I see you as a, the tallest structure we have in the world because you emulate that. So whatever he did to you, know that the rest of us see you as beautiful and strong. And you are standing your ground here today. The message has been heard. I actually like that you started out with, I imagine hitting you, because it's a message to all potential victims and current victims we don't know about suffering whatever abuse that they do have the right to hit to protect themselves. And that's what you are doing here today, protecting all others. And I admire you for that because you didn't have to be here. You chose to go public to speak on behalf of not just everybody who we know about, but all those unknown voices. They can have a voice as tall and as loud and as meaningful as you. So I thank you, I think you are wonderful, and you are going to make the biggest waves that will continue to reach out to others, and I want to thank you for that now. Thank you. Next. 
Your Honor, you will next hear from survivor Jeanette Ant Ant Antolin. I apologize. Um, she is um, has authorized to be publicly identified, and she will have a support person with her, um, John Manley. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Could you please state and spell your name for the record prior to beginning? Yes, Jeanette Antolin, J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E-A-N-T-O-L-I-N. Thank you. What would you like me to know? As I said, my name is Jeanette Antolin. I'm a former gymnast and was a national team member from 1995 to 2000. I started my gymnastics career at the young age of three. I became a national team member by the age of 14, dedicating my childhood to the sport I love. Gymnastics for me was life. It wasn't just something I did, it was my passion. I had the honor of representing my country in two world championships and many international competitions. As a national team member, I trained at the Curly Ranch and was treated by the team physician, Larry Nassar. Larry was an employee of Michigan State and was someone we all held as one of the best doctors in his field, because that is what we were told. We relied on Larry to heal our injuries, help us, and help us achieve our dreams. He gained our trust with his likability and compassion. But little did I know that behind his good guy facade, there was a monster preying on innocent victims such as myself. Larry manipulated, violated every ethical code of being a doctor. He robbed a good portion of my gymnastics experience, but not just for me, from countless women. It's hard for an outsider to understand the world of elite gymnastics and to understand how a man like Larry could gain the trust of so many young girls and to sexually abuse them for so many years. For a young girl away from her home, being worked into exhaustion by screaming coaches, a kindly doctor, offering relief from pain and a little sympathy was easy to like. I was raised in a culture of gymnastics where we were taught, your voice doesn't matter. You follow instructions and never complain, especially about treatments. You often hear that becoming a parent changes everything. And it's true. Becoming a mother has made me realize that I would do anything to protect my child. It's our profound responsibility as adults to keep our children safe. As a parent, you feel your children's pain. My mother wishes she could have protected me from this monster. She's completely heartbroken and distraught from everything Larry has done to me. Only a monster would harm innocent children the way that Larry did. As a mother, I understand how gravely heinous Larry's treatments, treatments were. I am disgusted that anyone, let alone a father himself, could carry out such grotesque acts. I absolutely blame Larry for what he did to me and how his effects, how, and how this affects and it impacts my life daily. It makes it hard for me to trust people and negatively impacts my relationships with others. I will never fully understand the evil that motivates an adult to abuse an innocent child, but I do understand the evil that motivates organizations like USA Gymnastics and Michigan State to turn a blind eye to this abuse. It is the evil that places money and medals above the welfare of children. This is something that he depended on to continue to carry out his misdeeds. Can I address Larry? You may. Personally. Larry, you made me believe that you were my friend. You deceived me, you manipulated me, and you abused me. I truly believe that you're a spawn of Satan. You used your hotel room as a personal playground to treat us. 
You use my innocent body as your sexual play toy. The biggest competition of my life that I trained years for, you stole that from me. My experience with you is all I remember about that. Those little girls that you took advantage of so easily have now come back to haunt you all of the days of your life. As you sit behind bars, I pray that you are tormented by the very memory of the words spoken to you by all of us brave women standing here today. There's no therapy that will fix the evil that is deep inside you, and I know that all of us women will heal, but without your prayers. I know that God will heal me and help me survive, and I will come out stronger on the other side. After this is said and done, you will be forgotten, but no one will forget how us women have gotten the strength to stand up and take you down. They won't forget how we've changed the trajectory of abuse in the sword of gymnastics. And I hope that God has mercy on your soul. I'm pleased to see that Larry is one step closer to spending a lifetime behind bars. He was allowed to prey upon children for more than 20 years and he must be held accountable for these crimes. Courtrooms are places where criminals face justice. In this case, justice can only be served by having Larry receive the maximum sentence. This will ensure that he's properly punished for his despicable crimes and will send a message to him and other abusers that the time is up. No longer will people like you get away with this kind of stuff. This man should never be able to be around innocent children, let alone people in the public ever again. Thank you for allowing me to read my statement. Every time I'm able to speak up about my experience, it makes me feel less like a victim and more like a survivor. I pray that my words have truly shown how this man has affected so many. Now it's time for justice, and I can only hope that you see it through to the full extent. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I truly want you to know that your voice does matter and that you are and always will be that responsible parent that he failed at being for his own children and for all of you. You speaking out protects your children and the children in all of our communities, so it's so important. And I know you were at two world championships. You are still a champion, and I have to say, the biggest championship is this, speaking out publicly, protecting others. There is no greater responsibility that we all have, and you as a champion recognize that. If I could give each of you a gold medal, I would. Because what you're doing here is more important than the Olympics, and I know that was treasured. And it was a goal for you and for all the girls. But putting someone like this behind bars, making sure that your voice is heard through legislatures around the country and the world, will be the goal that we all seek for the safety of all of our children. And so your voice streams of gold through it, and that's what I see a champion for a lifetime, not just at one round of a game or a sport. I know you were dedicated, but dedicated, as you just said, your voice will continue to speak. That's the real goal. Thank you so much. You are a pillar of strength and facing him now means that you are healing and your children can have a whole parent of that. And that's more important than anything, isn't it? Thank you so much. Thank you. The next survivor you will hear from is Amanda Thomas-Show. She has authorized to be publicly identified, and she will be accompanied by her father, 
Mike Tomashow, who I believe you met yesterday. Um, I did. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? It's Amanda Tomashow, A M A N D A T H O M A S H O W. Thank you. What would you like us to know? In 2014, I had an appointment with Larry Nassar for hip and back pain. From childhood appointments and hearing about him professionally from my mom, I knew he was a big deal. Dr. Larry Nassar was a trusted name in the medical field, and I felt lucky to have an opportunity to see such a prolific doctor for old high school injuries. I showed up full of hope and excitement. From my past appointments I'd had with him, I'd gathered he was goofy and handsy, but because of his well-known, widely respected title, his odd behaviors that should have raised, raised red flags, barely raised eyebrows as they were dismissed and brushed off as part of his quirky personality. There I was, entering into his office and anticipating greatness, placing my personal health and well-being in the hands of that man, a man I was told deserved my trust, my respect, with his degrees decorating his walls, enforcing the farce all riddled with his name and title that he used as a shield to hide behind. That man was the hero doctor in town, and he had us all fooled. But in late March of 2014, I found out that man's true identity. Larry Nassar was no hero. He was a villain. At the end of a long and tiring appointment, that man sent his resident out of the room and then stuck his hand up my shirt and down my pants. He sexually assaulted me in spite of my protests and, I, and would not let me leave until I agreed to come back for a follow-up assault. It was terrifying and disgusting and I spent days in shock from the violation I had experienced at his hands. I knew he was a praised doctor, a healer of Olympic gymnasts. He was the miracle worker of Larry Nassar and he had just abused me on his appointment table. I didn't know who to tell, and I was scared no one would believe me. Sometimes I even had a hard time believing myself, but at the end, I knew I had to report it. He was so smooth and so calculated at that appointment. He used his position of power, his reputation, and his stature to make me feel special and comfortable, and then he sexually assaulted me. I could not let what happened to me happen to anyone else. After finally finding the courage to make the call, I contacted a doctor I knew worked with Larry Nassar and told him my story. It was uncomfortable and embarrassing and I felt like throwing up the entire time, but I did it and I hoped the worst was over with. Dr. Coban thanked me for coming forward and told me we would be in touch soon. It was hard telling my story, but I could rest a little easier knowing I was helping protect future potential victims. I waited to hear back from the university for days, and then weeks, and I started to feel uneasy again. I started to give up hope, and I worried my words hadn't been taken to heart. Eventually, I did get a phone call from Christine Moore at MSU's Office of Institutional Equity, and I started to feel hopeful again. She asked to hear the details of my complaint, and when I started to explain exactly where Larry put his hands without gloves or another person present in the room, she wanted to meet with me in person immediately. I again relayed my story to her and a police officer, and I thought maybe this time I would be taken seriously. They seemed to be horrified by the details of the sexual assault I had experienced and reported to them in no uncertain terms. This time, I just knew my voice had been heard, and this disgusting man would never be able to hurt anyone else ever again. At least that's what I thought, but I was wrong. The investigation done by MSU was brief and sloppy, and it left me feeling disposable and worthless. After asking a few of his friends if what he did was inappropriate and getting a collective answer of, well, I would have done it differently, but I guess what he did was okay, Larry Nassar was cleared to practice again under new guidelines that were never actually enforced. When asked about the assault, Larry gave an answer about how he couldn't remember the exact appointment, but it seemed like something he did, and I must have been mistaken about the sexual nature of the procedure. He was directly confronted with the evil thing he did to me, and he was given an opportunity to admit his problem and get better. 
but instead he denied everything and added insult to the injuries he had already left me with. I was not one of his younger victims without words to explain what he did. I was a woman in my mid-twenties studying to go to medical school and working at a pediatrician's office. I knew that he had abused me. I reported it. Michigan State University, the school I loved and trusted, had the audacity to tell me that I did not understand the difference between sexual assault and a medical procedure. That master manipulator took advantage of his title, he abused me, and when I found the strength to talk about what had happened, I was ignored and my voice was silenced. I spent years trying to get over what happened that day and the damage the investigation did to my life. Years of not being able to trust anyone in messy relationships and feeling so alone every single day. Years scared of doctors and men and figures of authority. Actually, I'm scared of people all the time. I'm uncomfortable when people get too close during conversations and I jump if someone touches me without warning. I'm jittery and I'm nervous around men, I'm constantly overanalyzing situations. It was almost four years ago now and I still have nightmares about that day. Sometimes I'm just trapped in his examination room and he won't let me leave. Other times I'm being held down on the table and I'm yelling, but my voice doesn't work. What he did shows up in my daily life and it also affects me while I sleep. Since this case was reopened, I've struggled to even leave my bed on some of my worst days. I wake up crying, feeling empty, and my anxiety about facing the world paralyzes me. Sometimes I call loved ones, but most of the time I'm too embarrassed to call. So I spend another morning crying under the covers for hours before dragging myself out of bed and going to work where I spend the day nervous and restless and uneasy around everyone. What happened to me bleeds into every area of my life and I feel tense and fearful all of the time. When Larry Nassar sexually assaulted me and MSU covered for him, they altered the entire course of my life. From my career path, it's just the way I get, navigate through crowded rooms. Everything has changed. Sometimes I'm terrified that these scars are too deep and I will never be whole again, but I cannot allow myself to remain a victim any longer because I am a survivor. And even though he left me with these scars, I survived what that evil man did to me. Someday I will be whole again. And Larry, the thing you didn't realize while you were sexually assaulting me and all of these young girls and breaking our lives is that you were also building an army of survivors who would ultimately expose you for what you truly are, a sexual predator. You might have broken us, but from this rubble, we will rise as an army of female warriors who will never let you or any man drunk off of power get away with such evil ever again. Thank you, that was wonderful. You are a survivor. Your scars are healing. Your voice is no longer silent. I have heard it, the world has heard it, and you are not alone. You not only have the other survivors, but you have a world who is in support of all of you. This cannot happen. You are ensuring that others will not be violated not just by this defendant, but by other predators. Things are going to change. You've been heard. The system clearly failed you, and I'm sorry about that. It's not the first time. I suspect it won't be the last time, but you are part of making that system better. I applaud you from the very instant it happened for speaking up. It's interesting to me this morning, I've heard from three. I know I'll hear from many more today and in the days coming, but I also heard the same yesterday. This defendant could also have been charged with unlawful imprisonment. It sounds to me like the number of crimes that could have been charged and weren't is almost endless, and they are all vile acts and you were right in pursuing what you did. And I want you to know that I'm taking all of that into consideration at sentencing. He will never be free. The next judge he faces will be God. Thank you. To 
George, um, just for the record, uh, you've heard from both of um, the Tommy Show sisters, uh, Jessica yesterday and Amanda just now. Um, and I know you have a binder of statements, and, and obviously those statements include more statements than just those that are being um, delivered in court. I just wanted to point the court's attention, because I know you've likely probably already read all of them, but that their mother, Dr. Tom Suzanne Thomas Show, also wrote statements on behalf of both girls. Um, and particularly, her situation is very unique, having gone to college with um, medical school with the doctor, with the defendant, um, and referred patients. So. Yes, she has a very unique voice. Does she want any or all of that read, uh, read into the record? Um, I will um, ask her on a break, and I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very um, much. Our next uh, survivor, her mother, is going to be delivering her impact statement, um, and they have requested anonymity. So I would ask that there be no recording, no dissemination. I spoke with one of the media um, representatives today. I guess in the other courtroom, when they turn it off completely, it's a little confusing. They don't know if it's a, a, a snafu of some sort. So we've got a, a process in place that they have assured me will not. I'm sorry, so the one that will now be identified is speaking yes. aside from the other, and the three will then come up after. That's my understanding, right? Okay. All right. Um, thank you. This is Gwen Anderson. Thank you. Please come up. Please state and spell your name for the record. Um, <clears throat> oh, I can't Take see your time. Name. It's okay. Um, Gwen, G-W-E-N, Anderson. A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. All right, thank you. We do that for the record. I know you said it, but I do need you to do that. And I need you to just, can you take a break? Please take a break. We have more Kleenex there. I can get you some water. Just speak slowly and try to speak up so the court reporter gets your words. It's really important, okay? I'm naturally really loud, so it's actually hard to not. That's okay. We like loud. <laughs> this courtroom absorbs it, so as loud as you want. All right. Very okay. comfortable. Oh, sorry. I want to thank you for all that you've done here, allowing us to be here. Submit letters, videos, speak here in person. You've given us a voice. A chance to be a part of a, a part of this process. When you, when MSU and USA Gymnastics, and realistically Larry's own lawyers, deny responsibility for what they have done to us. You, however, have validated our betrayal, our abuse, our heartbreak, and our devastation because of his actions. And I thank you not only for myself, but for all of us. I remember getting my coffee in the morning, it hit the news. I remember because I never have the TV on in the morning. But that morning, I had a little extra time and I flipped on the news. I remember them describing Larry. And before they even said his name, just by his description, I knew. I knew that his picture was about to pop up on the screen. And then it did. My heart sank. I watched as they mentioned a question procedure and my heart sank even more I knew that procedure he had done that procedure to me and I remember thinking mm -mm, no 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 way this can't be happening this can't be real he couldn't have been molesting us it can't be real they have to be wrong something must be wrong I remember not being able to focus clearly on anything so much so I remember my students asking me if I was okay <laughs> because it was obvious that I was in a daze. <sighs> See, I'm a middle school teacher and I teach 12, 13, and 14 year old kids every day. And every single day when I look at them, I am faced with the reality of how young and defenseless we were when Larry molested us. I look at them every single day. I look at them every single day and I think to myself, I am their safe place. 
I am their protector. I am their fighter. I am their encouragement. I am their motivator. I am their rock. They are more to me than my students. They're my kids. They trust me every single day to look out for their best interest, and I take that very seriously. And that's exactly how I felt as a middle schooler when I was with Larry. He was going to make sure my injuries were healed because he was my doctor. He was my encouragement, my motivation, and what I believed was my safe place to speak the truth about how much pain I was really in. To know now that he took those beliefs, he took that trust and used it to molest not only myself, but over 140 young girls is something I still can't comprehend. I still can't think about without crying. We were just kids. We were just kids. I remember meeting with my former coach, Tom. This is Tom. Um, about what was going on with Larry in the news. I was trying to come up with a way to defend Larry so that it couldn't be true and it wouldn't be true. It just could not be true. Not Larry. I remember the heartbreak on his face when I told him that I had had the procedure done a couple times. I remember him asking if Larry used gloves. And if you're wondering, the answer is no. No, he did not use gloves. And yes, I remember, because I still remember the feeling of his hands. I still remember flinching from his touch. And I still remember him saying, it's okay. I know you're not used to being touched there, but it'll feel better. I remember at that exact moment, I realized I'd been molested by somebody I trusted, that I was one of the gymnasts he had abused, that my life was never going to be the same, and that it was true. Look at her. I realized that I was one of the gymnasts he had abused and that my life was never going to be the same. I remember seeing the devastation on Tom's face when I said no, that he hadn't worn gloves. And I remember Tom taking a minute to collect his thoughts and process, collect his thoughts and proceed by saying how sorry he was. Because see, Tom was one of my coaches. Like all of our coaches, he was our protector. They are our fighters and our encouragement and our coaches are like our family. And they couldn't protect us from him. They couldn't protect us from him. And it isn't their fault. And they know that. And we know that. But it doesn't take away the hurt, the betrayal, and the devastation that we all feel because of him. I remember crying to my parents over the reality of the situation. And I remember the heartache in their voices. See, my mom was in the room when he did it. She had taken me there. She had no idea what he was doing. How could she? He was so precise in where he stood and how he positioned his body. She was in denial about Larry in the beginning too, like most of us. She even wrote him on Facebook. And Larry responded with how innocent he was. And I quote, I keep praying for the truth to be revealed and for the goodness to come to light. I am strong in my faith in God, and with the love and support of my friends and family, I will overcome this. Well, God has shown the truth. And you will face him one day. That was my mom's moment of clarity when the child pornography broke. That was her moment of devastation and her moment of truth of the reality of what was going on. You might wonder why I remember all of this like it was yesterday. And the answer is because I live with this internal conversation every single day. I relive, relive these memories and these moments every single day. I no longer have the luxury of going through life with rose-covered glasses to the deplorable, disgusting realities of the world. I look at my two sons, my two beautiful boys, who I love more than anything in the world. And I think about the things that I can't do anymore and the things that they won't ever get to do because of my fears. My fears that someone I trust or they trust is gonna hurt them. 
hurt them in a way that you can never erase or forget, in a way that leaves a mark on your soul, a mark that will be there for the rest of your life. But that mark is not a mark that's going to define who I am. I stand here today not only to tell you my story, but to show the kids behind me and the ones that can't be here today that this will not define us. What he did to us is not going to define who we are. He's going to sit in jail for the rest of his life. We, on the other hand, are going to move forward. We are going to live our best lives because we are fighters and we are strong and we overcome impossible odds because that's what we were trained to do and that because that's and because that's what we know how to do because we are gymnasts and i wanted to end by saying that i've seriously struggled with the decision to allow myself to be recorded and shown in public because i was scared that my students would see me at my weakest moment they would see me as a victim but i realized but I've come to realize that this moment is not my weakest moment, that this is my moment of strength. This is my close, my, sorry, this is my time to close the chapter of being a victim and open my chapter of being a survivor. And that's standing here today, facing the man who molested me as a child. And share my story is my time. I decided to let the media know my name my face and my story because I want my two boys to stand to sorry I want my two boys to see their mom stand up for what she knows is right and I want my students to see that I'm doing what I encourage them to do every day which is be the change you want to see in this world and I want to see that this never happens to anyone again and that those responsible are held accountable and being here today and telling my story is part of that change. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words. I agree. This is not your weakest moment. It is your strongest moment, but it's also your most important moment because as that role model for your students and for the world, you also are telling them that they can speak up and you're teaching them the best lesson in life. No means no. That always goes unrecognized by predators. And I always say this, and you haven't been to my courtroom, so you haven't heard it, but I always say that God put N and O in the alphabet for a reason together. It spells no, use it. You win by healing while he disintegrates and that is exactly what will happen. I know that you started out by thanking me and I think all the victims have thanked me. But I want you to know that I don't need thanks, I'm just doing my job. I always try to do the right thing. And you all have loud voices, and I've heard them, but I wanted to hear them. When I met with the lawyers, and they approached saying, would you even think of a plea? I said, only if. There's a global resolution where all the victims, regardless of who they are associated with this case or not, anyone associated with this predator could come before me and testify because it is a global resolution and I want to hear globally all the voices. And you've been part of that and I'm so honored that you came here today, that you decided to reveal yourself because there is nothing more important in your healing and in stopping predators in every form. I'm honored that you're in my courtroom. Thank you. I don't deserve the thanks you do. And just for the record, since you spoke out, uh, Tom, could you tell me your last name is Ballot? Last name is Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N. And formally, it's Thomas? 
Thomas, yes. Normal spelling? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for being here. For the here. record, go to hell. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say? Oh. Me? You. You're here, sir. You spoke out. I'm allowing you an opportunity. Uh, you seem to have a few things you want to say. I think the world probably wants to hear, and so do I. I have a different relationship with Larry from the standpoint that I was a coach for many years. I'm also an exercise physiologist. When exercise I physiologist? Yes. When I graduated from grad school, he was an advisor of mine. He's been a mentor of mine. I've done clinics with him for years in the past, and I've probably sent well over 100 kids to him over the years. So the guilt I feel for that is hard to, uh, hard to fathom. So, he didn't only deceive these girls, which is honest God, that's the worst of the worst, is what he does to these girls. So they have the voice. But what you did to anybody else who trusted you and sent girls your way is disgusting, reprehensible, unforgivable. That's all I gotta say. Sir, thank you very much for speaking up. I hear that guilt that you feel, and probably so many referrals to him have the same voice, sentiment that you do. But again, I truly appreciate uh, there not being any blame on anyone. You should not take the blame as well. There are, is no girl who was assaulted who's blaming you or anybody else, thankfully. Blame lies solely with defendant. Mm -hmm. I'm getting that. I Thank appreciate you letting me speak. Thank you, sir. It's more about her. I understand. Next, do we have the is Amanda Bartarian and she has agreed to be identified publicly yes. and her mother is accompanying her as her support person. Thank you. Ma'am, please state and spell your name. For Amanda, the Amanda Bartarian, A-M-A-N-D-A -A -A B-A-R-T-E-R-I-A-N. Thank you. What would you like me to know? Um, I stand before you a woman of faith. I have been blessed with God's protection and the strength to speak today. I am grateful for the opportunity to be here and to share my experience. As many of us here are victims of sexual abuse, which was suffered under the care and at the hands of Larry Nassar, I do not feel the need to discuss in detail his despicable and sickening behavior, which I endured as a young child and into my teenage year. Being one of his regular patients at MSU and as a competitor for USA Gymnastics. Instead, I am here to gain closure and express the things which I feel may be necessary for me to move forward with my life and to continue healing. While it has not been easy to find the strength to be where I am today, I am here as a survivor. I am no longer a victim. I have wasted so much time trying to put into words the effect that Larry Nassar has had on me and how to the how to express the amount of damage that he has done to me and how negatively he has impacted my life. However, I am here today because I refuse to let Larry Nassar take anything more from me as he has already taken enough. Dr. Nassar knowingly used his position and his authority to take advantage of me and so many young and innocent children. Being physically violated and robbed of my innocence and my childhood does not even begin to describe the emotional damage and the lifelong challenges me and so many girls will face as a result. As a child, I may not have had the courage to eat or even the understanding to know exactly the depth or severity of his actions. However, I am no longer a child. <clears throat> And further, I have never been more disgusted or disappointed by any human being. Although ultimately it is not up to me to judge the actions of others, I can finally rest knowing I have done my part in making sure Larry Nassar will never have the chance to hurt another child. 
I will find comfort knowing that he will finally be forced to take accountability for what he has done and will suffer the consequences for his actions in this lifetime and beyond. Ma'am, thank you so much for your words and for being here. Can you, and you don't have to answer this, how old were you when this began? Um, well, I began as a patient when I was, I believe, 11, maybe younger. Um, yeah. So. I'm really uh, proud of you for refusing to let him take anything else from you that tells me that you have started to heal. And you're right, it will take a long time, but that healing started really today when you publicly came forward and said no more. That's really huge. And the world is watching, and your message has not only been sent to this court, but to others who feel they may not have a voice, and to other predators and hopefully legislators who may change some laws I'm not sure the outcome of this, but I do know that you have done your part and done it well and been a champion at doing it. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Next. Survivor um, is being publicly identified. Her name is Jamie Dosky, and again, she is a friend of Gwen and Amanda, who you just heard from. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, her husband is accompanying her to appear today. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Would you please state and spell your name for the record? Jamie Dosky, J A I M E D O S K I. Thank you. What would you like me to know? First of all, I'd like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to express our experience and giving us a voice. I will never forget the night I saw Larry's face on the news. I was watching Dancing with the Stars, then a commercial for the news came on with Larry's face and allegations of sexual abuse. When the allegations first came, I had two thoughts. First was this absolutely can't be true. It's Larry. Second, I always had a feeling deep down that something wasn't right. The moment I heard about the questionable procedure, my heart sank. I was a victim. Over the next couple of months after it first came out, realizing that I was a victim of sexual abuse by someone who I trusted is a feeling that is impossible to explain. I started seeing Larry when I was 12 years old for back pain. Being a competitive gymnast, the only doctor to go and see was Larry Nassar. He was who every competitive gymnast hoped to see to help with their injury. You were lucky to have him as your doctor. I walked into his office at Michigan State the first time and saw every one of my idols on the wall, notes and letters framed expressing their gratitude to him and how much they loved him. As a 12 year old, the last thing I would think is that his way of treatment was anything other than making me feel better to get me back into the gym. I trusted him and he used that to manipulate me. I will never forget that first appointment and every appointment after. Off and on for 13 years, I saw Larry as my doctor until I had my first surgery four years ago. I sent other family members and friends to see him. I often wonder why I continued to go back, but the truth of the matter is that I did trust him. And I truly believed he had my best interest at heart, even though I know how uncomfortable I was at every appointment. I told myself, he is the best, it's just not like that. Larry Nassar was never Dr. Nassar to me. He was Larry our friend, and not only to myself, but to my family, coaches, and teammates who trusted him also. I have felt sick to my stomach every day since realizing I have been a victim of his over 10 times for his own sexual pleasure. He knew exactly how to take advantage of us and did it every time. I was lied to and made to believe that he was on my side. For me personally, talking about my feelings is not one of my strong points. I internalize everything, which is why I have so much anxiety. Seeing a therapist and regular visits with my doctor helped me make sense of everything. I have a two-year-old son and a daughter on the way, and I will make sure nothing like this ever happens to them. I want to show my family how strong I am and that I am a survivor. I am here to stand with the rest of these women and to speak up and hope that this doesn't happen to anybody else. One of the things that gymnastics taught me was to be tough and talking about what made me uncomfortable was a weakness. 
I never realized how much this, this affected me until deep down, affected me deep down until all this happened. It was like a part of me was completely broken, but I'm finally able to be free and validated. I could speak up and talk about being a survivor. Larry took away a part of me that I will never get back, and I will spend the rest of my life trying to make sense of all of this. I hope that Larry gets what he deserves and serves the maximum amount of time for doing what he has done to me and so many other women, including my fellow teammates and friends. Thank you very much. Ma'am, whatever he took from you, whatever you feel that you won't get back, I promise you, by speaking out, that strength that you have, that is a healing power. And whatever empty space you feel that he took will be filled by something better. Thank you. You're going to get stronger and stronger. And I know that especially because you recognize that speaking out is important for your children that you're speaking out for. So I applaud that. You are tough. You're going to get tougher. And the world will watch all the great things that you do on behalf of the other survivors and your children. And of course, the sports. Because I think all of the survivors see the need for sports to hear the recklessness that can occur when proper procedures are not in place. So your voice will make those changes. And if they don't come, maybe we shouldn't attend sports events. Maybe we need to have even louder voices. I don't know what the remedy is, but I do know that each of you will stand together and make sure that sports is safe for your son, your soon-to-be-born daughter, and all of our children. And that is an immeasurable difference that will be in the world and should start filling that empty piece of yours because it is gold. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being here and for your husband to stand by you. Not all men stand behind women who make these statements. And sir, you and the rest of the families are to be applauded because I have in this very court seen the opposite. So when families come forward, husbands, coaches, parents, siblings, it is so meaningful. Mm -hmm. So thank you. May I say something, Your Honor? Yeah. What's your name for the record? Ryan, R-Y-A-N. There's circles of hell reserved for people like you. Thank you, sir. Um, the next survivor to speak is Janelle Mall, and she is um, comfortable with being identified publicly, and she's a company's husband. Yes, and we also have her um, picture on the screen as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Could you please state and spell your name for the record? Janelle Mall, J-E-N-E-L-L-E-M-O-U-L. Thank you. Thank what would you like me to know? I would like to thank you for this opportunity to express the damage that has been caused by Larry Nassar. You have given us all the chance to have a voice and to stand up against the evil that he has inflicted on the gymnastics community. Larry, I have thought about writing this statement for over a month now. I have written and rewritten it in my head. Everything I have come up with doesn't come close to properly describing the mental turmoil you have caused in my life. You never insisted on being called doctor. You were Larry, my doctor, my idol, and most importantly, my friend, or so I thought. I thought you were helping me, and I have now come to learn that you were just manipulating me, my family, my coaches, and my friends so that you were trusted. My mom was sitting in the room with me that day when you performed this act. I didn't think anything of it because I trusted you so much, so I didn't tell her what you had done. Although it hurt and it was uncomfortable, I trusted that you were doing what was best for me. For 13 years, I didn't think anything different until September 2016. When I heard that there were accusations against you, I could not believe the accusers and defended you to a fault. 
As more and more accusations came out, I was distraught and thinking that you were this monster they described. It didn't take me long to realize that you are the monster they described. And all that time you were helping me, you were just manipulating me so that you could take advantage of me. I thought you were fixing me, but I have realized you broke me. I have daughters, daughters that want to be gymnasts. I have struggled with letting them become a part of this sport, a sport they want to become a part of because of my, because of my love and joy for it. I have now become a victim of sexual assault by two trusted people within the gymnastics community. You made me a victim for the second time in my life and for that I cannot forgive you. I hate that I was a victim once with no action taken against that person and to know now that I am a victim again has destroyed me. But I'm standing tall and fighting against you and everyone involved in letting you continue your reign of terror on this tight knit gymnastics community. You must pay for what you have done so that changes happen changes within this community so that my young daughters may never, never feel the hurt and turmoil you have caused me, my family, my friends, my teammates, and my coaches. I am currently mourning the loss of my grandfather, who was everything to me, and at every single one of my gymnastics meets. But instead of giving him and my family all my thoughts, I am sitting here having to think about you and all the damage you have done. I hate that you are taking away from what should be a time filled with grief and remembrance. You don't deserve my thoughts. He does, and they do. And with that, I hope you get as much time in prison as possible. I hope you are never able to walk outside those walls as a free man. But most importantly, I hope that all of the survivors that you have hurt are able to heal from the damage you have done. Judge, I want to thank you again for your time and consideration. You have given me a chance to have a voice when I didn't think I was able to. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the thanks. It was never a question in my mind. It's part of my job to hear from all victims. You, your voice, the voice of all of the victim survivors will bring him, maybe not now, but eventually, as he shrivels in prison. He will die there. I don't have to read a crystal ball to know that. The change that you want, you are part of the, that very important change. All of the victim survivors are causing change that will be a rippling effect. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I believe that to be a fact. And I'm not allowed to lie from the bench. <laughs> I am so very sorry for your grandfather's passing, for his loss. The closest person to me in my life was my grandfather. And that was in 1975, and I still feel the loss and feel him around me. And I do know that your grandfather is here and hugging you, too. Thank you. And he and the rest of your family will help you get through this. So as you get stronger, defendant will get weaker. And I know everybody's referred to him as Larry, not doctor. But to me, he's a defendant like all the other criminals. Someone without a name who's done so wrong he doesn't deserve to be called by his first name or by his former title. I hate even using his last name now after hearing from all of you. He is defendant to me. And at some point I hope that he becomes simply defendant to you, part of your past and part of your armor for the future because you certainly are strong. Thank you. And I know your husband's proud of you, your family's proud of you, and your children. You are the best role model. All of the victim survivors are. And so now you all do have that army to go forward with your message. He'll be behind bars, but he's not the only pedophile. Absolutely. Your voice will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time, I think what we need to do is take 15 minutes because we have a, an 11 o'clock that yes. we need to deal with. And I want to make sure we're doing that on time and all the technology works. Is that all right with everybody? Yes, yes. All right, so we'll take 15 minutes and then we'll come out and deal with the technology and then we'll hear the next person. Thank you. All right.
Are ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the next survivor to speak is Madeline Jones. And as you can see, she is um, on Polycom. She's a, a freshman at Boston College. And she's accompanied by her aunt, who is sitting um, to her left. And her parents are here in court as well and will be staying at the podium um, during her statement. I'd also would like the record to note that we have a photograph of um, Ms. Jones at the time of the abuse. And I will turn it over to the court. Thank all right. you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you all for being here, the parents. And thank you for being available by Polycom. I should thank the county for putting in this new equipment this year um, because it makes it accessible to people around the country like yourself. So I appreciate your time and the arrangements that you had to make to get here. So I do know that your words are very important, and I want to hear them, but I need you to begin by stating and spelling your name for the record. Uh, I'm Madeline Jones, M-A-D-E-L-E-I-N-E-J-O-N-E-S. Thank you. What would you like me to know, ma'am? Um, I guess pretty much just explaining that it's through camera just because I started my second semester at Boston College and I will be reading a statement that my mother wrote as well, which I think is important because she was in the room. Um, so the first part of my statement, I'll differentiate between the two, but I'll be speaking in third person for some of it because it's my mother's statement. All right, and I just, you talk really fast, and I needed to just slow down a little bit. Okay. And it especially happens when people read things. So pretend okay. you're reading to the five-year-old me and slow down. <laughs> Okay. Judge, can I interrupt just, uh, she has charged victim B in Ingham County, and I think that's an important thing for you to know. Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed. You may proceed. In February 2011, my 11-year-old daughter was in extreme pain and couldn't bend her back at all. I took her to see Larry Nassar under the advice of her gymnastics coaches. Little did I know that the extreme pain she was in back in 2011 would not even compare to the pain she's experienced over the past six years. We had multiple appointments with NSAR. I would have to leave work early, drive her to school, pick her up, and drive an hour to Michigan State. I can't imagine what my daughter must have felt sitting in the back seat of the car. Yes, she wasn't even old enough to sit in the front seat. The anguish of knowing that your mother is driving to an appointment to get sexually assaulted. The anguish of being that mother who sat in a chair while her daughter was assaulted. Let me tell you a little bit about what our life has been like because of what Larry Nassar did to my daughter. My once happy, determined little girl became depressed and disinterested, but still struggled with her desire to succeed, which led to even more frustration. She was just 12 years old when she first expressed suicidal thoughts. If you've ever tried to get a young girl proper mental health care, you would know that it was almost impossible. If you've ever been on the phone with someone, 
telling them that you need help to keep your daughter alive, and resource after resource turns you away. And for God is safe to keep the knives, medicine, and other dangerous objects away from your daughter. And as you walk around your house, you realize how fruitless your efforts may be, because there's just too many ways to kill yourself if you really want to. You ever received a phone call from your daughter, having to weigh the decision of going to pick her up when she's having a panic attack to the point where all you can hear is someone trying to catch the breath. But you need to decide on whether or not to make her stay so that the fight or flight response doesn't get worse. You ever had to call the police because you don't know where your daughter is and you feel the worst? You ever gone into your teenage daughter's room and stood over her bed to make sure she's still breathing? For years, we had no idea why our daughter was having such internal turmoil. It wasn't until September 2016 when I read the Indy Star article that I knew why. As crazy as it may sound, it was almost a relief to finally understand why our daughter was having these disturbing feelings. However, I was still in shock and horrified when I heard her describe in graphic detail to Detective Lieutenant Andrew Mumford exactly what happened during those appointments. Those 45 to 60 minute appointments. Over and over again when she was just 11 years old. The penalty for first degree criminal sexual conduct against an individual less than 13 years old is a minimum of 25 years to a maximum of life in prison. Including my daughter, there are three victims in this trial under the age of 13 at the time, which would bring us to a minimum of 75 years, excluding the other four victims. However, the plea deal sets a range of 25 to 40 years. back on the record. Are we ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor, and we will um, resume where we left off. So, um, Ms. Kayla, and if, um, as we stated before, she has made the decision today that she'll be publicly identified and um, her photograph is being displayed at the time of the abuse and her um, mom is with her. Thank you, you may approach. Please state and spell your name for the record. Kayla, K-A-Y-L-A, Spiker, S-P-I-C-H-E-R. Thank you both for being here. What would you like me to know? Your Honor, my name is Kayla Spiker. In this statement, I will not be talking about the details of the assault for that is already known too well. When everything first came out about Larry, I didn't believe it, or should I say I didn't want to. When I finally realized what happened, I was scared. For almost 12 years of my life, hundreds and hundreds of visits, I was sexually assaulted and was unaware. Not because I was naive, but because I was a child, a child who trusted you. Who was I to question you? I was ashamed and humiliated about my life. I was not ready to tell my family to tell them their only daughter and their only sister had been sexually assaulted for more years than she had been alive. If I told them that, I would have to see the fear on their faces and the pain in their eyes, and mine would multiply by 10. So instead, I tried to pretend the whole thing wasn't real. I tried to push it out of my mind, but it was too heavy. Because of you, I now find it hard to trust not only myself, but everyone around me. I am constantly questioning people's intentions about everything. You are one of the most well-trusted people in my life. I thought you genuinely cared about my well-being and me. If you were able to do this to me, what would stop the next person? I would have never thought trust and loyalty would ha have been a bad quality to have until now. Because of you, I am now scared of the world we live in, 
just knowing there are people like you out there. I was so young and you took advantage of that. To say you did nothing for me would be a lie. You helped me through some of the toughest times in my life, physically and mentally, but now you have caused more pain than I have ever endured. Because of what you did, you knocked down both of our towers. Your damage was concrete, stripped of titles and degrees. My, da my damage was internal, unseen, and I carry it with me. You took away my worth, my privacy, my innocence, my energy, my time, my safety, my confidence, my childhood, and my own voice until today. The damage is done and no one can undo it. Now I have a choice. I can let this destroy me. I can remain angry and hurt, or I can face it head on. I can accept the pain and move on. You have taken enough of my time, too many of my tears, and taken over too many of my conversations. It ends today. Today is the last day you'll be talked about for me. All of us will persevere, move past what you have taken from us, and be better. And for you, you will spend the rest of your life in there, never to be talked about again by us. And you will just become a sad nobody. Choosing to come out publicly was one of the hardest decisions I've ever faced. I didn't want people to look at me differently. I didn't want people to see me as broken, but I am not broken. I am strong, stronger than I've ever been. I chose to do this because no one should ever feel ashamed to come forward for help, advice, or just to have their voice heard. Because we are not victims, we are survivors. Thank you. Outstanding, and because of what you've said, you've taken your power back. You had it temporarily because of your trust, mm -hmm. but your words, your presence here today, they are immeasurably valuable for all survivors, and especially your healing. And I have every confidence you will be just fine. You have the support of your family. Mm -hmm. I see how distraught your mother is. Mm -hmm. But I think this, hearing your words, will also help her and your family. So thank you for being here. Thank you. You are having a rippling effect in the world. That means that your power not only is back in you, the light is back in you, but the power is being felt by other victims. And that is immeasurably valuable. Thank you. Of course. And thank you, Mom, for being here. Next. Here, the next survivor uh, will be publicly identified. Her name is Jennifer Hayes. She's accompanied um, by her husband today. I have also displayed a photograph of Jennifer, the age of the abuse. Thank you. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Could you please state you can spell your name for the record? Sure. Jennifer Hayes, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-H-A-Y-E-S. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hayes, but you knew me as Jennifer Grimm. I was a former competitive figure skater and head coach of the MSU synchronized skating team while a student. Larry, you sexually assaulted me multiple times while I was a student at Michigan State. You took complete control. You were confident. You had created a secure world where you brainwashed everyone around you to enable and protect your action of self-pleasure. I was a young woman seeking medical advice, treatment, and pain relief, but instead, I was molested, shamed, and removed of my dignity. And I never got any relief for the pain in my back, hips, or ankles. The entire reason I came to you in the first place. The first time you assaulted me, you said, I'm going to realign your back, and some find what I'm going to do a little uncomfortable. What was that supposed to mean? How was I supposed to respond to that? 
You then never explained the procedure, never let me know what exactly you were about to do. Instead, you told me to lie down on my stomach and open my legs. You then parted my loose shorts that you always made me put on. And without warning, forcefully pushed your dry fingers into my vagina. Touching areas that have never been touched before. I hadn't at that point even seen a gynecologist yet. He remained inside me for about 15 minutes at each session. I was in such shock that I flinched and then grabbed the exam table with both hands as hard as I could, closed my eyes tight and held my breath, frozen in fear while each muscle in my body remained tense, just waiting for you to be done, for it to all be over. I was absolutely terrified. I had no idea what was happening. I had no reason, reason to believe you were going to do anything to me internally. You told me you were going to realign my back by doing this. However, you were touching and manipulating intimate areas that were not even close to my spine. I had seen countless doctors and therapists for back, hip, and ankle pain since birth, and I never had a doctor stick their bare hands into my vagina and then call that treatment. You have claimed this procedure was a medical treatment. Why did you then exclude it from all my chart notes? Why did you never give any step-by-step -step detail of what exactly you were doing and for what purpose? Why was your groin always up against me while your fingers were inside me? And when you suck your fingers inside me, why did you never once wear gloves? Which you know is against OSHA standards and therefore subjected me, you, other patients and the community to infectious diseases. Why weren't you concerned of my well-being, never asking me if you were making me uncomfortable or if you were causing me additional pain? Why did you feel the need to violate me and use me as your sexual specimen for your own sick sexual pleasure and satisfaction? You said on December 7th in federal court that you really did try to help people. But how did you help me? You also admitted in federal court that you are addicted to young girls and women, but compare this to addiction, this addiction to alcoholism and drug abuse. Like it's no big deal and more socially accepted. You said that others may wonder how you got down this path. This is not some trail you stumble upon one day. You intentionally and strategically placed yourself in positions of trust and power around girls and you intentionally chose each and every time to assault us. It was your decision, not ours, and most definitely it was not mine. When you said that you really did try to be a good person and really did try to help people, I wonder how can you with complete honesty say that you're a good person who tried to help people? You made us all believe that you had our best interests in mind and that you wanted to help us. But that's not the truth. The truth is it was all a lie and a setup. You used your reputation, your medical license, and your authority to brainwash children, young women, parents, colleagues, the athletic community, and me. In November, in this very courtroom, you stated that this was like a match that turned into a forest fire out of control. I don't understand what you mean by that, really. Are you insinuating that your current situation and all of this was our fault or that it was the media's fault? Because you didn't give us a choice to be robbed of our innocence and sexually assaulted and molested. You are the one person who caused the forest fire and it was your match. You also stated that you have no animosity toward anyone. You just want healing and we need to move forward. You can't tell us what we need to do. You don't have that power anymore. We will all be healing from the damage you have caused for the rest of our lives. I think what you're really thinking when you said that is that you're tired of dealing with your pain and you're tired of being in the negative media spotlight. 
You just want this all to be over. Hmm. Because you think this is all about you. And I'm confused why you would have any animosity toward anyone or why you believe that we'd even be concerned that you do. As a survivor of your actions, I am not concerned with what you want and what you think of us. You have pled guilty to all charges against you. However, I don't really believe you understand the magnitude of what you've, you've done in your 50 years of life, 54 years of life, excuse me. The damage you chose to inflict on me and the countless other girls and their families is despicable and frankly disgusting. I believe you really are an evil man. It's because of your actions that as an adult, you have diminished my self-esteem, increased feelings of shame, humiliation, embarrassment, powerlessness, guilt, guilt that I didn't prevent all the other girls who followed me from being abused by you, and anger. I am still so angry at you. You had no right to lie to me and no right to use my body. By earning a medical degree, it did not give you the right to inflict your personal sexual pleasure and evil on me and hundreds, if not thousands, of other innocent girls and young women. Because you yourself said you've performed this medical treatment thousands of times. To this day, 17 years later, I still have nightmares and difficulty sleeping from the sexual abuse that you inflicted on me. These nightmares stay with me for hours and days later. They cause heightened anxiety, especially when I'm around older males and ones in power or authority. Intimate relationships are difficult. I have feelings of guilt that I'm a disappointment because intimacy has created fear and I am forced to be reminded of your sexual assaults and how I hated every minute of it. I am then confronted with anger. You have caused me to no longer feel safe and robbed me of my own body and positive experiences that you had no right to steal from me. You had taken away the trust I once had in myself. I now have continuous feelings of suspicion and caution toward other males that they may have ulterior, sex, ulterior sexual motives. I never know when I'm going to be struck with an unexpected panic or an anxiety attack. I could be at the grocery store, cooking dinner, at my parents' house, at a doctor's appointment, anywhere and at any time. These can be absolutely paralyzing. You are responsible for causing me so much destruction and overwhelming suffrage in my life since meeting you. I have invisible wounds that have forever changed my life. My overall loss of strength, self-worth, trust and stress on myself has not only affected my life, but my children's lives, my immediate family, and my marriage with my husband. For years, I had difficulty standing up for myself, but not anymore. I am changing that today. You stole my confidence and my self-worth away from me, but I am regaining it. You will not break my core, and you no longer have power over me. As a mother of one, soon to be two daughters, I have now had to redefine what it means to keep them safe. I have been forced to continually reevaluate each adult around them, like teachers, other parents, family members, everyone. This is more difficult than you would ever imagine. I will raise my daughters with the knowledge and education about sexual predators like you. I am pleased that you will be in prison for the rest of your life, which is where you needed to be decades ago. You will never again hurt me or another girl ever. You have taken away a part of myself and my life that I will never get back, and I will never ever be again the same. But I will find peace. The other survivors, my family, and friends are helping me with that. I cannot forgive you today. You are in God's hands now. Thank you, Your Honor.
Thank you. That was very powerful, and it's very clear that you have found your voice, that you've taken back control and your power. You are among the many who've asked why. That question never will be answered. I don't know that there is a right answer. But you and all of the survivors have put out his blame, the match he struck and says was out of control. It's in control now, thanks to all of you. That's how powerful you all are now. Ma'am, there's nothing to feel ashamed or guilty about. You were a child. You need to let that go because the most powerful thing you can do is what you've said you're going to do, and I believe, is to educate your children and the community so we can put out everybody's flame in this regard. Thank you so much for being here for your Thank very you. powerful and well thought out words. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Good luck. Next. Um, the next survivor you will hear from is Nicole Walker. She is um, uh, okay with being publicly identified, and she's here. Um, and her boyfriend is supporting her. All right. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Ma'am, please state and spell your name for the record. Nicole Walker, N-I-C-O-L-E-W-A-L-K-E-R. Thank you. You may proceed when you're ready. Um, over the last year since the news broke, um, I've cut off a lot of my friends with no reason. I've shut down in many ways. And I just have to thank God that I have my son because without him, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. He gives me a purpose to be here. He had his first real exam a few months ago and was hesitant to let the doctor pull his pants down to check for a hernia. As Oh, yeah. Do I need to start over? Okay. Um, my son had his first real exam a few months ago and was hesitant about letting the doctor pull his pants down to check for a hernia. As I looked at his face, I could see that he was scared and I couldn't help myself from crying, so I had to turn away. The doctor reassured him that he had nothing to worry about and that only a doctor should do this exam. Those words reassured him as they should, but on the other hand, I felt extreme anxiety rush over my body. I told him that I told him that it was okay even though I wanted to grab him and leave. How do I ever explain this to my son? I should be able to tell him that it's okay, and he should be able to trust the doctors, but I don't trust anymore. This has caused me to be recluse. I have ignored phone calls and plans from friends because they can tell that something isn't okay with me, but I'm not able to talk about it. Yesterday, while in the courtroom, I had a statement that I didn't want to read myself. I wanted someone else to read it, but after seeing other people come up here, I decided that I won't let you get the best of me again. And I will stand here and say what I hope will bring me some sense of peace, if that's at all possible. I don't want anyone feeling the way that I feel, which is weak, or that something is wrong with me because of what you have done. But that's how I feel, and now people will know what you did to me and many other girls. I first came to you after an auto injury, which occurred during my gymnastics season. I came to you with high hopes of being able to be fixed and be able to go back to my normal season and get better and return to the sport that I dearly loved. When I first met you, you seemed eager to help and had concern for my back pain and problems. But not long after the first visit, you did something that made me completely uncomfortable. But because my mom was in the room, 
when I was told you were the best, I thought that you must know what you were doing. You touched me in places that you shouldn't have and stuck your fingers inside of my body without my permission. You didn't wear gloves. You didn't ask for my permission or my mom's as I was a minor. Instead, you took it upon yourself to violate me in a way that has changed my view on everything. And not once, but multiple times. Due to the fact that I was young and assumed that there was no way that a doctor would hurt me, you did in fact hurt me emotionally and physically. And that's something that I can't forget. I recall you laughing and joking as you performed your procedure while you talked to my mom. And it makes me physically ill when those thoughts pop into my head. I can be in the grocery store, at work, volunteering, and all I can think about is what has been done to me and how much it's affected my life. I didn't have much self-respect after that and stopped playing sports altogether. I now see only female doctors. I have my son, who I've never let be alone with anybody but family, and made sure that I know someone in his school district so that I can keep a close watch over him. I protect him because that's what you should do as a parent, but I go above and beyond to shield him from ever being hurt or violated by someone that he thinks he can trust. I don't sleep, I haven't slept good in years, and I wake up with anxiety and regret of what ifs. What if I had told my mom, my coach, a friend, a teammate, someone at MSU, would this have saved any of the other girls? Would it have made me feel any better? Counseling has also been a rough road for me. It makes me relive what you did to me. Not the day I go in to talk, but every day that I have to think about even going in to talk to my therapist. If I allowed it to consume me like it wants to, I'm not sure how I would get through my day. I have anxiety and sleeping disorders all because of what you did to me, and I cannot forgive you. I do not think you're sorry. I've tried my best to not read the articles, to not watch TV shows or the news, but it's everywhere. I hear people talking about it all the time, and anytime I see you on TV, you don't look upset. You don't look like you're one bit upset about anything that you did. The hardest obstacle in life is raising my child and having a relationship that I feel comfortable in. You have stolen pieces of me that I will never get back. You knew what you were doing was wrong and you ruined my trust for most people. This all coming up again has made me lose over 30 pounds and in high school developed an eating disorder. I lost so much weight that I looked extremely sick and passed out at school. Looking back on those pictures, I just think, why couldn't anyone have asked me if I was okay? How could someone not know what you were doing? My doctor now cares about me as a person, not as a sexual thing. And she doesn't make me feel uncomfortable when I talk to her about what you did. When my weight dropped, she knew something was wrong and I was hesitant to tell her. And I only wish that I could change what happened, but I can't. I wish you understood how much that I've been through and wonder where I would be if this had never happened. But that is only a dream to me. You are a predator and I hope you sit in that cell and ask yourself why on earth would you ever think that it was okay to touch any of us?
Don't let him rob you of enjoying your son, your family, your husband, your boyfriend, whoever's in your life. Children stay small for such a very long time, or very short time, and we have long lives. And I know that you're going to have a long life. Your child will stay small, very short, just like you were for a very short window. A youth, you were violated. Don't carry that violation into the next generation. Learn to be happy. You should get happier and live your life as defendant gets miserable and more miserable behind bars. Don't let him affect the next generation. Take your power back. Live happily with your child and your family, ma'am. I know you can do that. I've seen the spark in you. I think you're going to feel it again. Can you do that for me? Try my best. Okay. Well, sometime come back and show me your child and a happy smile. I know it's there. I'd love to see it. Thank Congratulations you. for your words, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Judge, the next survivor you'll be hearing from um, has requested uh, anonymity, so I'm asking that um, no recording, no dissemination, the whole deal we've already talked about, guys, um, not be put out there. Uh, her. Your Honor, um, this is Chelsea Williams. And okay, her husband is accompanying her to Derek today. Um, Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Please state and spell your name for the record. Chelsea, C-H-E-L-S-E-A. Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Thank you. You should just be able to speak loud enough. Otherwise, we can turn the volume up. Okay. If you lean over like that, you're going to get sore. <laughs> All right. So just speak loudly and okay. we're good. I know you have that cheerleader voice in you. <laughs> All right. What would you like me to know? Um, I would like to start, Your Honor, I know you said earlier that you're just doing your job, but I would still like to begin by thanking you for having us here and for just allowing us this opportunity to be heard. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. What would you like me to know? As of yesterday, I was identified as victim 118. But today, inspired by the courage of my fellow survivors, I'm not afraid to say that my name is Chelsea Williams formerly and better known to Mr. Nassar is Chelsea Kroll. How do you spell Kroll? K-R-O-L-L. -L. Thank you. And I'm a survivor. There are so many raw emotions surrounding the situation that trying to logically and succinctly convey the depths of suffering I've endured can seem like an insurmountable task. My aim for the statement is to try to constructively move through some of those emotions by naming exactly what has happened to me. I hope that this statement, along with those of the other survivors, can help move us forward toward justice. Because I want change and we need change. Before I begin, I feel it is necessary to frame what happened to me in light of some relevant aspects of the culture of elite gymnastics. Discipline and obedience. Because of the extreme physical and mental demands of elite gymnastics, training requires strict discipline in order to achieve results. The skills that gymnasts perform in competition are the result of thousands of hours of concentrated effort and intense work directed by a team of coaches. And in the gymnastics culture I and other victims experienced, these coaches are trusted and obeyed without question. <coughs> Human beings rightfully fear walking a narrow log across a river, for instance, because they may lose their balance, fall, and injure themselves before they make it across. A gymnast is trained to trust her coach even in the face of a similar danger when she mounts the balance beam and proceeds to not only walk, but also tumble across it. She does what her coach tells her to do with her body, even though she might fall. If she does, she is instructed to get back up. If she hurts herself, she's instructed to get back up and try again, and she does. In addition, all of us have been training since childhood. I began gymnastics when I was five years old. This results in a lifetime of obedience and ingrained trust in coaches and staff 
that cannot be underestimated as a factor in this case of abuse. Pain. Elite gymnastics is the result of decades of extreme physical conditioning. This level of conditioning results in incredible strength in athletic bodies, but also in a huge variety of injuries sustained over the course of a career. I've personally suffered a torn Achilles tendon, several broken bones, five abdominal tears, and a series of knee surgeries, including an osteotomy, a procedure that entailed breaking my femur and realigning my leg. I've witnessed close friends and teammates suffer ACL tears, life-altering back injuries, and career-ending shoulder surgeries. <laughs> Most people, even if they are not interested in gymnastics, are familiar with the actions of Carrie Strug at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. Strug performed a winning vault on a severely injured ankle to help the American team win the gold. The media painted her story as special and heroic, which it certainly was. However, her actions were not necessarily extraordinary. She was an elite gymnast. She was conditioned for over a decade to be perfect in terms of her form and power as a vaulter, but she was also trained to be obedient to the needs of her coach and her team and to bear unimaginable pain as if it were normal. Silence. One of the most prevalent attitudes taught to young gymnasts and ingrained in the culture of gymnastics is silent suffering. From the beginning, we are taught to soldier on through intense training sessions, through the emotional roller coaster of competition, through injury and fatigue, through pain. The stone faces you see on Olympic gymnasts mid-competition are the result of this conditioning. Pain was a fact of life for me because of gymnastics, but so was silence. I learned early on that pain was not an excuse and that it was shameful to even mention it. Pain was weakness, and so I learned to bear it for years through injuries that woke me up at night, that throbbed so much I would mistake them for my own heartbeat, that ached so badly I felt like someone had taken a hammer to my joints. Injuries that certainly would have sounded loud, insistent alarm bells for anybody else. To ask for help, to admit that something hurt, I had to be suffering such extreme and unmitigated pain that I could barely function. These problematic cultural aspects of elite gymnastics, obedience, unimaginable pain, and silent suffering were expertly manipulated by Larry Nassar to identify, abuse, and control his victims, not once, but systematically over their lifetimes in the sport. I was one of the people he repeatedly assaulted, and I was one of many. What follows is a description of what he did to me. The first time Larry Nasser assaulted me, I was 16 years old at USA Gymnastics Elite Nationals. I had been experiencing lower back pain, and I was in a lot of pain after this particular training session. My coach walked me into a small room in the arena, not the main training room, where I was greeted by Larry Nassar and another member of the USAG athletic training staff, who I am told is still employed by them. My coach went back into the arena at this point. Mr. Nassar said he had recently used a new treatment on a few girls with lower back injuries, and he felt that it had helped them. He said that it was an unconventional treatment, but if I trusted him, he felt that it could help me too. He performed this treatment on me at least two times at this event without the consent of my coach or my parent. Mr. Nasser had me lay face down on a training table with my legs slightly straddled. He pulled my leotard aside and inserted his gloveless hand inside of my vagina. He massaged inside of me in different areas and in a circular motion for what I would estimate to be 20 to 30 minutes before removing his hand. After he was done, he thanked me for trusting him. As I left that room, I felt such confusion and embarrassment because I'd never been touched in that internal area before. I had no idea what happened. I had no idea what to tell my parents or my coach after the treatment. Should I tell my parents what he did to me? How would I even describe it? I didn't have the words at 16 or maybe even 20, but I do now. As I walked back into the arena to gather my belongings, I remember thinking, it's Larry, 
he would never hurt you. Keep moving and see how you feel tomorrow. Maybe it will work. I had two days standing between me and my first USA National Senior Elite competition, and I would have done just about anything to take the pain away. In my young soldier trained mind, the only option that made sense to me was to block out my back pain and everything associated with it, including that tiny room with Larry Nasser. Later in my life, it was recommended that I go see Mr. Nasser for evaluation of a calf injury. I was experiencing a very severe throbbing and burning sensation in my calf that would not subsist to any degree. The throbbing would wake me from sleep in the middle of the night and I would feel a seething burn during simple tasks such as walking to the mailbox. I had seen several prominent physicians and physical therapists in Ann Arbor who were unable to find the source of my pain or give me any relief of it. It had been recommended and supported by these other professionals that I see Mr. Nasser, as none of them could seem to help me. I was then connected with him via email, and he promptly got me on his schedule a few weeks later. Upon examining me and performing several tests and manipulations, Mr. Nasser very casually referenced using the procedure he had used to treat my lower back pain when I was younger to treat my calf pain. He mentioned that the treatment may not work at first. However, he felt confident that each treatment would begin to build on each other as we continued our visits. I found it strange that he would be using the same treatment on my calf as he did my back. But after exhausting so many other resources, I did not question his suggestion to perform this procedure again. I believe there were several reasons for this. For one, I had already justified it so many years ago as a child. Knowing that he was still performing this treatment over a decade later actually made me more comfortable with the idea of receiving it again. I assumed that this procedure had become a widely known and accepted treatment since he was still using it. Perhaps this is why I got in to see him and especially why I got in to see him so quickly. It gave him the opportunity to repeat the abuse. I saw Mr. Nassar once a month for two years at the MSU Sports Clinic, in which he abused me over 20 times. Each time that he performed the procedure, it seemed rehearsed, as if he had done it so many times it became commonplace. Mr. Nassar would have me lie down on a training table with my legs slightly straddled. He would instruct me to wear loose-fitting shorts so that he could easily pull them aside and insert his gloveless hand inside of my vagina. He would massage inside of me in different areas and in a circular motion for 20 to 45 minutes, depending on the appointment. One time in particular stands out vividly in my mind. I was scheduled for the last appointment of the day on a late Friday afternoon in winter. The clinic had been running behind schedule and there was not a patient room available for me. The nurse led me to a supply room where she took my vitals and stated that I would eventually be moved to a patient room when one became available. I was never moved to a patient room. Later, Mr. Nassar entered the supply room and began his usual appointment protocol. The nurse came into the room and alerted us that we would be the only people left in the practice. In the middle of his exam, he left the room for 20 minutes without explanation, even upon re-entering the room. He then performed the procedure on me for what I would estimate to be 45 minutes, the longest amount of time I can remember him performing it. I left the MSU clinic approximately two hours after my scheduled appointment time. Part of me wondered why he had spent so much time with me on a Friday night, especially when he had a family waiting for him at home. Another part of me wondered what he was doing for those 20 unanswered minutes. Was he pleasuring himself? I quickly, almost habitually, brushed aside both thoughts, thinking yet again, it's Larry, he would never hurt you. I got in my car, drove back to Ann Arbor, and simply felt grateful that he had spent so much time trying to help me. One small yet significant detail that strengthened my trust in Mr. Nasser's intentions were the actual treatment rooms designated to him at the MSU Sports Medicine facility. His particular treatment rooms were adorned with photos of Olympic gymnasts and other prominent athletes who he claimed to medically treat. 
I would walk into his room thinking that if he treated all these athletes, gymnasts in specific, that I was undoubtedly in the right hands. I knew all of the gymnasts staring back at me from those walls. Several of them former competitors, a few of them former teammates, and many of them outspoken survivors of his abuse. It was as if he created a shrine of his conquests, of his victims, in hopes that this overt display would deter anybody from thinking that he was in fact a predator. He paraded around his office touting about the many Olympians he had treated. He would return from world championships or the Olympics and gift me pins telling me he was thinking of me. In the middle of treatment sessions, he would trade stories with me about USA Gymnastics, sharing a mutual disdain of the organization. He blamed the toxic culture of USAG and the demands that they placed on athletes for the injuries that some of us, including myself, were still combating a decade later. He would discuss adult topics with me, such as his favorite choice of beer or his plans for Friday night, and even crack oral sex jokes. Mr. Nasser used these casual conversation pieces to slyly transition the trust that he had built with me as a 16-year-old girl into a sort of friendship with me as a 20-something adult. Though he abused me at two very different points in my life, both in age and circumstance, there are several common threads that tie both incidents together. Both injuries brought with them such a heightened level of pain a pain that created the deepest sense of helplessness and desperation that I can ever remember feeling. I had exhausted all other resources for pain relief. I felt so alone, so isolated, as if no one could help me. Mr. Nasser was aware of this inequity. It is so hard to process why I would go to such lengths to alleviate pain, why I had that extreme mentality, especially as a 16-year-old girl. I think for a while I thought something was wrong with me or that it was my fault. I am only now just starting to see how this mentality was cultivated and groomed through my years as a gymnast and how it evolved through time. It is my belief that Mr. Nasser recognized it when I was 16 years old. He capitalized on it when I was an adult. I picture me face down on that table at the MSU Sports Clinic and I just remember feeling that, like that little 16-year-old girl again, laying on the training table at USAG Nationals in such pain, just looking for someone to take care of her. It was that desperation, that helplessness, that Mr. Nasser used as his tool to abuse me at least two times as a minor and over 20 times as an adult. He manipulated me with such ease, with such finesse. This is perhaps what scares me the most about him. Throughout the past year, I've heard a myriad of questions surrounding the timing of survivors coming forward and of sharing their stories. I read comments such as, why did these girls not report this earlier? Why now? How could they not know he was assaulting them? Speaking as a survivor of this man's systematic abuse, I do not believe these questions are relevant any longer. If you're still asking these questions, then you do not have an informed understanding of what has happened here and of what has been happening for years. You have no concept of the culture of gymnastics, a culture that promotes fear of challenging authority, an environment that often breeds physical and mental abuse, and a system designed to limit parental involvement. You have no idea what this man is capable of doing and of how he used the weaknesses of this culture to satisfy his own demented needs. You have no idea what he managed to do bluntly in the face of authority. You have no idea what he continued to do, even as survivors reported incidents, and as authorities became aware, and in some instances were aware from the very beginning of what he was doing. You have no idea how creepily intelligent he is, and how he used this intelligence, both of the nuances of the sport and of the individuals he targeted to manipulate little girls and young women alike. We need to stop asking questions and start taking action to prevent abuse of this magnitude or any magnitude from ever happening again. The aftermath of Larry Nassar's actions, as well as USAG and MSU's complicity, are vast and multifaceted. Through many sessions of therapy, I am reliving these moments week after week, day after day, hour after hour, an attempt to unravel the web that was created and perpetuated by each of them. 
I am finally able to clearly see how MSU and USAG enabled Larry Nassar's pedophilic behavior, further exacerbate, exacerbating a situation that could have been resolved many years ago. It is difficult enough to pro process that I was abused by a predator, but to know that there were other people in the room when the abuse was happening and that there were people who could have stopped the abuse or reported it, but didn't, that, that is perhaps the most difficult truth to swallow. No man should have been able to conduct this procedure without the expressed consent of a parent. The fact that this was not properly flagged earlier by these organizations, which are entrusted to safeguard athletes, many of whom are children, the very fact that this man was ever alone in a room with little girls is reprehensible. More accountability should have been there. It was not. More accountability needs to be there in the future. With the help of my support system, I'm learning to let myself work through this, hopeful that I will find healing accompanied by change in the end. But this abuse has had and undoubtedly will have a profoundly negative impact on my life. It has left me ridden with sadness, severe anxiety, and an inability to execute my personal and professional responsibilities. There will never be a time when I'm not recovering. There will never be a time when I can leave this in the past. Your Honor, may I address the defendant directly? I speak to you now, Mr. Nasser. Recently, you have described this situation as a match that turned into a forest fire out of control. I suppose you meant to use this analogy to rationalize your horrific delusional behavior as if it were all blown out of proportion. My question to you is this. What if you had just lit a single match? What if you had only ever performed this horrifying procedure on one single girl? Would it matter? Would you get away with it? That's what I believe you were hoping. That each girl you assaulted would be just one isolated voice, impossible to hear. But I believe that we all matter, no matter how many or how few of us there may be. You have said that now is the time for healing. I remember you using similar words at USAG Nationals and at the MSU Sports Clinic. You're still attempting to use the same manipulative tactics in the courtroom. You're still attempting to prey on our weaknesses, even behind bars. We had given you our deepest level of trust, a trust that you would take care of our bodies and heal them to the best of your ability. You violated our trust to the highest degree. The damage that has been caused is a direct result of your actions, and you do not get to decide when we are ready to heal. We may never fully heal, and you need to face the truth and the consequences that accompany it. Your Honor, if I have to live with this for the rest of my life, Mr. Nasser, the defendant, deserves a sentence that will affect him for the rest of his life. And that sentence should be multiplied by however many girls and women he assaulted who will also carry this for the rest of their lives. I believe justice can be a catalyst for change. And the first step toward creating the change that is necessary is by not allowing Mr. Nasser to be a free man in our society ever again. We may have been silenced for years, but it is this silence that will forever bond us in a sisterhood. It is this silence that has challenged us to find our voice. We have found it. We are using it. I just ask that you hear us. Thank you. Ma'am, I have heard you and all the others, and I, I have to say that your speech encompasses you were the 44th victim I've heard. Your speech is comprehensive of every statement that's been made to me so far. I suspect also of those who will come after you. As you were speaking, there were several 
survivor victims and their families who also nodded at several points that you made. You all share that same feeling against defendants and your words are very powerful. You talked about the sport saying get up and try again. Well, you have gotten back up and you are not going down again. I heard that in what you said. There was a lot of strength and courage there. And you survivors have stopped the enabling. And that's really empowering for all of you. I feel that you're letting go of some of what you have. I know you have work to do, but being here, reading what you've done, thinking about it, publicly speaking it, asking for more accountability will help make the changes that are necessary. I can't thank you enough for the time that must have taken you hours. And it must have been painful to write parts of those. Your descriptions are so vivid and are the same pictures that I've had over and over again from the victims. Now all of you survivors. I hope that you can put this behind you. He will be behind bars for the rest of his life. I wish you joy and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Um, the next young woman is a minor. I understand her parents are here in court with her. I believe she has um, decided to be publicly identified. Is that accurate? Okay, so before I, I said her, I wanted to just confirm. I know she was um, um, discussing that uh, earlier with me. Um, this is Stephanie Robinson, and you're 17, is that correct? And this is your dad? Okay. Um, her father's here with her, Judge. I'll let you uh, take over. All right. Would you both please approach the podium? Sir, could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to provide would be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. May put your hand down. Sir, you have talked about your daughter testifying publicly, correct? Yes. With her? And it's your mutual decision that she go forward and be public with her statement, her voice, her photograph. Is that correct? Yes. And you're giving her permission? Yes. All right. And no one's forced, threatened, or coerced you to do this or to make this decision or to force her to do it in any way. Is all of that correct? Yes. All right. So you're satisfied that uh, it's in her best interest and the families as we go forward that she make her statement publicly with her image and voice? Yes. You may proceed. You agree with all of that? Yes. All right. Now, you're a little soft spo spoken. I need your cheerleader voice. Okay. Right. That's very good. If you just edge up. Okay, podium, sounds good. You're good. If you could state and spell your name for the record and then proceed. Okay. Stephanie Robinson, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, -E, Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. Thank you. You may proceed. Your Honor, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a statement of impact regarding the abusive actions of Larry Nassar. I understand that this statement is intended for your consideration. However, I would like to take this opportunity to address the defendant as well. You may. Larry Nassar, it's hard to believe that someone with your level of medical training and expertise decided to take advantage of me, a young woman, only 14 years old, the first time I came to you for hip pain. In the past, I blame myself for not knowing what was happening sooner but now I know it was not my fault. At first, over the three years and dozens of times that I saw you, I was confused by your actions. You acted like you cared, but really all you were doing was baiting me into your sexually abusive trap. After the time, you offered up your own office for my dad to step out of the room and take a phone call. So we were alone in the examination room. I knew how and where you were touching me was not acceptable medical treatment. I am disgusted by your actions, and that is why I am here today. Since what you did, I have felt anger, fear, sadness, anxiety, frustration, self-consciousness, and unbelievable levels of stress. I've also struggled to trust others. 
Society teaches us that we should be able to trust doctors. And I thought I could trust you. But instead, you abused me. You were not trustworthy. And I have deeply struggled to trust a doctor since your sexually abusive actions occurred. I have also struggled to believe that doctors have my best interests in mind. This lack of trust has spread beyond doctors to other people, including some friends, family members, teachers, and other authority figures. And to think, I even job shadowed you for a day at what could have been the height of your career when you could have been a positive role model, educating and mentoring the next generation, you chose to use your position of power and trust to fulfill your own sick, selfish desires. You are no longer a doctor. This whole situation that resulted from your sexually abusive actions against me has been mentally, emotionally, and physically exhausting. At first, I felt shame and the desire to hide, but now, finally, justice is occurring. Regarding your court sentence, I believe at the very least a minimum of 40 years should be imposed. However, the reality is, with the vast number of known victims, and most likely many more who may be afraid to come forward, the maximum sentence should be imposed. May you never hurt or abuse another person again. While I came to the stand as a victim, I leave as a victor because you do not have the authority anymore and because I am one of the many women who are helping to put you behind bars for the countless crimes that you've committed. And lastly, I believe my faith in God will help me heal and I hope that you seek him in your life and ask for his forgiveness because he is the ultimate judge. Once again, Your Honor, thank you for your time and for giving me the opportunity to have my voice be heard, to, have, to begin the healing of my heart, and to have the truth set us free. Your voice of children should always be heard. And at 17, that's really a powerful statement that you made in coming forward at your tender age and acknowledging what happened. It was so very important because there's so many more children out there so many more predators this one will be behind bars but your statements go a long way not just for your healing but to allow others to come forward because you're absolutely right there are so many more who have not mm -hmm. come forward both in this case i believe and in many other countless cases so justice will be done mm -hmm. and that's why we're doing this so that all of your voices can be heard and you can all move forward and that I consider the vastness of what defendants actions has done in all of your lives and in your family's lives. Mm -hmm. I hope you learn to trust again. Mm -hmm. I hope that begins with this court. There are caring adults. Mm -hmm. There's a caring community. All of your sister survivors care. And I think that in the long run, you all will help each other by being here, but in the future. Your message shows me that you are vastly older than 17 in your understanding and in your ability to speak. Thank you. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. You have nothing to be sad about anymore. He's gone. You need to live a joyous life. You have the support of your family and this community and I think the world. So we are looking at you as worthwhile, as strong, as able, as confident. Take those other words you told me that you were feeling. Put them away with him. Mm -hmm. You've taken your power back. He has none. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next. All right, we are back on the record. Council uh, for Defense, it was just told to me because I was so anxious to just get started today. And usually, as you know, I open the day with appearances for the record. I didn't do that. 
And so let's just do it now so we make that record, although it's late. I just need to uh, note that there is a different attorney on behalf of defendant. Uh, the prior or the current attorney uh, who was here yesterday uh, has a co-counsel here because of her unavailability. And so just on behalf of the people, uh, could you just tell us again who you are for the record for today? Good um, afternoon, Your Honor. Angela Pobolaitis, P58430, on behalf of the people of the Michigan Department of Attorney General. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Robin Liddell, on behalf of the people with the Attorney General's Office, P68287. Your Honor, Chris Allen, also with the Attorney General's Office, P75329. And the lead detective? Andrea Munford. And I have a fancy number. <laughs> You have a fancy badge, I'm sure. All right, on behalf of defendant. Your Honor, Matt Newberg, on behalf of Larry Nasser, I've been here all day. Should I call your mother to wipe up your spill? <laughs> yes, you have. Your Honor, Molly Blake from Shannon Smith's office. I'm going to have to sir. Thank you very much. All right. <coughs> your Honor, it's my understanding that the people are going to read a statement on behalf of uh, Dr. Karaginas, that's spelled K-A-R-A-G-E-A-N-E-S. We object to the reading of that statement. Uh, Dr. Karaginas is not a victim of Larry Nassar's. We indicated in a plea agreement that we would uh, expand the number of individuals that could come speak to the court, limited to the victims, the individuals, the girls that uh, Larry Nassar saw during the time that he was a doctor. Dr. Karaginas, we've been provided that statement is not a victim of Dr. Larry Nasser. He has nothing to do with any of the charged offenses. In fact, he indicates in here that he was in interviewed by Michigan State University for their Title IX, and also that he spoke to some of the individuals that he referred to Dr. Nasser, and indicates that he talked about the abuse. It's my feeling that this statement being read in court is to dis distance himself from whatever individual li liability he may be feeling. He's not here to read this statement on his own. He's asked the Attorney General's office to do it. I just don't think this is the proper forum. I don't think the Crime Victims' Rights Act allows that statement to be read in this forum, in this court. So we're going to object to the reading of the statement. Thank you. Um, Response? Thank you, Your Honor. As we indicated in chambers on Friday when I brought this to the court and defendants' object, uh, attention, Dr. Karaginas reached out to me first as a medical professional who had treated a number of victims and, and brought those victims to us to give impact statements. He also asked if I would be able to read a statement. It's, it's, I want to make it clear he's not um, a victim of um, any physical assault of the defendant, but he has prepared a statement. He has asked that I read that statement on his behalf. Um, in my understanding from our, our discussions in chambers, I'll let you speak to that as to your ruling. Um, but it is a request that I'm bringing forth on behalf of Dr. Karaginas. The Crime Victims Act really gives me wide discretion in a number of things. In regard to this doctor speaking, he was involved, although on the periphery, but I have to say that this defendant's criminal actions are far reaching beyond the victims he touched. It also touches the public, universities, sports, and the medical community. The medical community having a voice here, I think is important. Whether I factor that into sentencing or not, I don't know, but I think it's important that all those who have been victimized, including the medical community, have a voice. That's why we're here. That's what I'm allowing. And you are allowed to proceed. Objection overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. And if you could, for the record, spell his name. I can. K-A-R-A-G-E-A-N-E-S. Thank you. His statement is dated January 10th, 2018. Stephen J. Karaginas. Stephen with the V or PH? V as in Victor, uh, comma D O, comma F A O A S F, past president, American Osteopathic Academy of Sports Medicine. 
Dear Judge Rosemary Aquilina, thank you for the opportunity to have my statement read today in your courtroom. Although I was not a patient of Nasser, I was his colleague. I was his friend. But recent events have illustrated that these relationships were illusionary. I was a pawn, a means to his end, a victim of his devious, underhanded, and sickening mechanism, mechanizations, excuse me, designed to fuel his sexual perversions, to derive personal gain at whatever the cost. Although I am speaking for myself, many other physicians who knew Nasser share similar sentiments. As I watched Nasser admit to his crimes, I realized this changed the context of all of our encounters over the years. For as he was grooming his victims, he also groomed his environment. I cannot speak to anything he ever did in clinic since I never worked side by side in any clinic, Olympic venue or any event. But that was the point of the grooming. He made us believe that he was ethical, compassionate, and caring for his patients without having to observe him being so. Nasser's admission made me realize that he groomed me for 28 years to help him commit sexual assault. All of our interactions since we first met in medical school have different light cast on them. To wit, Nasser wrote a chapter in my textbook in 2004 where he specifically outlined the proper guidelines used to perform any medical technique that involves contact near genitalia, guidelines which he admittedly violated repeatedly over the many years. He did manual medicine workshops and lectures at our sports medicine conferences whenever I asked, again, espousing proper te treatment techniques to other doctors. He asked me to induct him as a fellow of the academy, a most prestigious honor within academic medical academies. I gave a speech about his caring, compassion, skill, and selflessness. Around 2008, he took part in a video project where we filmed us doing osteopathic techniques along with several other sports medicine fellowship directors. Again, the techniques he displayed did not involve anything related to the crimes he confessed to. He gave me numerous DVDs and CDs with videos of him performing treatment techniques on nearly all regions of the body. We worked together on Michigan's concussion bill, which became law in October 2012, and so on and so on. All of these things did one important thing. It gave Nasser credibility. It made it nearly impossible for any of us to believe any story that Nasser would commit any violation of these self-professed norms. It gave Nasser cover to, in case anyone questioned his methods. Our credibility helped Nasser's credibility. I'm sure many other doctors can give similar testimony on their experience with Nasser. But my, my most recent experience with Nasser is, most, is more disturbing. Nasser called me the day before the first lawsuit was announced in September of 2016, giving me a heads up. He then proceeded to ask me to help garner support against the women suing him. He sent me videos of his, te his techniques to watch. He acted as though he was completely innocent. He asked the Michigan State University Police to interview me as part of the Title IX investigation in October of 2016 to talk about his medical techniques that he was supposedly doing. He asked me to give the Sports Medicine Academy we worked for, excuse me, let me repeat that. He asked me to get the Sports Medicine Academy we worked for to write a letter in support of him, as well as me. He told me he had a list of over 150 physicians, trainers, and therapists who would vouch for him, and he wanted me to help get more. Most disturbing, Nasser sent me a text message on October 3rd, 2015, telling me, telling me he, quote, finally had had enough and re retired from, unquote, USA Gymnastics. On a Saturday night at 10.07 p.m., six days after he announced the same on Facebook. I thought it was odd at the time, but then I considered it an honor to be considered important enough in his life for him to text me. I 
understand, now understand what this actually was. It's clear that it was part of the grooming. He did all this to get doctors to feed him victims, to hide his behavior, to discredit his victims, to continue abusing women and girls. Nasser tried to use that credibility, my credibility, our colleagues' credibility, to support his actions, discredit the women suing, so he could beat any charges and lawsuits and go free to commit those crimes again. After all, if over 140 medical professionals say Nasser performed appropriate techniques, believing the victim's testimony becomes more difficult. I have talked with patients who he abused after I referred them. They told me all the details about the walls of pictures of famous gymnasts he had in his treatment rooms at Michigan State, which intimidated them, yet paradoxically, made them want to give their picture, get their picture up on the wall. They told me about the, the abuse that happened right in front of their parents under a sheet. They are suffering now. This is part of them. The medical community suffered as well. Any physician like me who sent patients to Nassar lives with the remorse of not knowing what he or she was actually doing. Patients' trust in medical professionals has been shaken. Those who defended Nasser must deal with these consequences. Many have openly questioned the osteopathic profession, thinking that the violations Nasser per per perpetrated were legitimate procedures. I, know I now live with knowing that our friendship was just a ruse. Our academic pursuits were just chips that Nasser banked over the years so that he could cash them in when he needed using me and others like me all over to refer him victims and protect him in case he was ever accused. But Nasser needs to know one more thing. His life's work will merely end up being a futile waste. The medical profession has raised awareness of, se of sexual assault, educating physicians on detecting signs of assault and predatory behavior, making counseling and mental health services more available, in reinforcing proper medical procedures to keep the sacred doctor-patient relationship pure. Doctors everywhere, will soon, will, doctors everywhere will soon forget about Nasser, but this example and sexual assault awareness will save the lives of many potential victims and improve physicians' ability to detect, report, and treat it. Despite Nasser's attempts to harm and damage them, the victims are finding strength in unexpected places. Their example coming forward, persisting in getting their claims heard, as well as the efforts of their attorneys and law enforcement to uncover all his criminal and predatory behavior has made the national hashtag MeToo movement possible. Sexual assault in the United States is in the public conversation now, uncovered in numerous professions and important reforms are underway. Though the victims would most assuredly prefer they never met Nasser in the first place, and their damage can never be undone, the ones I know are determined to no longer be a victim, but merely a survivor. Other vic victims still need help, and it is our responsibility to give that help. These problems will not be fixed overnight, or even in the short term, but with enough work, our communities will heal and bounce back from this, despite the efforts of Nasser to harm them. To Nasser, please let him know that I am sorry that the joy of helping young women achieve their goals and wildest dreams was not enough for him. If our mutual mentor was still alive today, he would regret ever knowing you. To the victims, I want to say to you that I am sorry I am so sorry that any of this happened. I am sorry any help has been slow to come your way. I wish I could have stopped him. I wish I would have known, but I will do whatever I can do in my power to help going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And to Dr. Kara Genius, I want you to send the message that his words in part shed light on how this was allowed to be hidden for so long. It's another piece of a puzzle here as to what happened. 
there's also the common thread of regret and remorse, but that needs to be converted to change, public healing, new public policy, speaking out, and I agree, and that's why we're here, that's why I've let everybody who wants to speak out, because sexual assault needs to remain in the forefront, talked about and fought against. I'm hopeful it will be from this day forward. I am still a little bit hesitant because after Ricky Holland, a case that we're all familiar with in this community, I had also hoped for change, that CPS would get better. And there were promises, but those fell short. I am hopeful with Dr. Karaginas' words that he will continue the fight with the survivors and with important people collectively speaking out, being one voice, working with legislators across the country, not just in Michigan. Maybe someday we can eradicate sexual assault against everyone. Thank him for me. Is there a next statement? Mary Stretch, um, I believe the next um, statement we will be reading is an anonymous one that was submitted to our office. Um, so I would ask that there be no recording or dissemination of that statement. Um, So this is as to victim 50? Victim 10. Oh, I'm sorry. It was the 50th victim I think I'm okay. hearing. Sorry, I wrote that down. Um, but it's victim 10. 10. All right. So she'll be known as victim 10. You may proceed. All right. I don't want to write this. I've been dreading this moment where I would have to come face to face with my feelings and emotions and tell the court and the defendant exactly just how much damage has been done. This hurts. This is not fun, but it is necessary for me to heal, or at least to start healing. I don't think I can accurately express in words just how emotional this process has been. To face down these words, I am a victim of sexual assault. I am a survivor of sexual assault. I don't even know if one can survive the events that rob a person of their wholeness, their innocence. All we can do is try. All we can do is support one another as the band-aids are ripped off every time sexual assault is mentioned. Every time a family member or a friend or the media, knowingly or not, engages in victim blaming. Every time you found out that one of your heroes has been victimized by a monster. I'd like to think I could have stopped him. Could I have? When you were fooled by him and manipulated into not even knowing the difference between right and wrong, when decades pass before you realize that this was sexual assault, could any of us have stopped him? Did he have that much control over us? Was his big, big bad gymnastics doctor God status too much for any of us to take down? Could I have prevented my heroes from his filthy hands? This is the guilt I bear each day. This is the shame I feel each moment of each day. Lying in my puddle of tears, I often ask myself if I will ever feel happiness again. How could I? I am disgusting. To myself, to my husband, to anyone who looks at me and may ask, how could you have not known? Why didn't you tell your parents, coach, anybody, any adult? If you are asking these questions, you truly do not comprehend the abuse of power by this master manipulator. I began to love gymnastics from the age of six. 
and truly fell in love after watching the 92 games. I wanted to be an Olympian. Sure, it was a long shot, but I still thought if I could train as hard and exercise my passion, I too would experience the magic that gymnastics had to offer. And boy, did it. I surely didn't become an Olympian, not even close, but I trained as hard as an Olympian would and had the best experience with gymnastics that a person could ever have. The first time I heard about Nasser was through my experience working out at Twist Stars Gymnastics Club. My teammate who had trained with the Getterts for a long period of time talked about his ability to fix her. I was envious. He was the gymnastics doctor, physician to the Olympians. Due to the long training and constant over, overuse injuries, I too was broken from gymnastics. I first personally came into contact with Nasser when I injured my ACL after coaching one practice, whereupon I was rushed to Twistars for an expert assessment from the one, the only, Dr. Nasser. I was referred to his partner for surgery, but that experience of being with him in the same room the one who carried off my idol, Carrie Strug, only a couple of years before, was equivalent to meeting a celebrity. When I began experiencing back troubles a year later, I was referred to Nasser. I was a student at Michigan State University at this time and felt a strange kinship that I was going to see the MSU gymnastics team doctor, the Olympic gymnastics team doctor. Even though I was never anywhere near their level of talent, it seemed like I belonged to something, some kind of club that was special. The greater Lansing gymnastics community I was in, I knew everybody. I was loved, I belonged. I was still coaching at the time and I knew that a few of my gymnasts had seen him. I was excited. I remember feeling like an Olympian as I drove to the appointment and saw the autographed framed pictures of my heroes decorating his room. Little did I know that I was signing up for what is now daily emotional pain, guilt, and depression that I am certain will last a lifetime. He sexually assaulted me four times. He digitally penetrated my vagina and groped my breasts inappropriately four times. It hurts so badly to write it, to know that someone will read it aloud in a courtroom of strangers, but ultimately, that this is now a truth in my life. I remember him asking each time at the beginning of the appointment if what he had done in the last appointment helped. What were we supposed to say? No, it didn't help? Well, then I wouldn't be able to see the Dr. God anymore. And in that sense, I would be giving up my gymnastics identity, which I wasn't prepared to do at the time. And so he continued to manipulate, play on his authority status, abuse little girls sexually for his own purposes. I often wonder about the sociopathic nature he continued and continues to exhibit. I truly do not think he is remorseful. I truly believe that he flaunted his sexual abuse and child pornographic exploits in the face of everyone who trusted him. You really did think you would get away with this, didn't you? But as a fellow victim's husband said so brilliant, brilliantly, you didn't know that one day these scared, powerless girls would grow up to be the brave, fearless women who would expose you for the unimaginable monster that you are, that we would stand united together and take our power back. Nasser, you deserve an eternity of suffering for the damage you have caused, and there is no bone of forgiveness in this body, for you robbed me of that when you put your filthy hands all over my body with malice, disrespect, and a sheer will to destroy me as a human being deserving of love, dignity, and the right to be happy in life. How has this crime impacted me? I am broken. I am trying to put the pieces back together through counseling, but I know deep down that I will never be the same. Again, this reckoning with the idea that I am a victim of sexual assault has been excruciating, unexpected, and has blindsided me. I got married last year. I earned a master's degree recently. You would think with all these accomplishments that I would be happy, ecstatic, ready to tackle the rest of my life with a loving husband and armed with an education that seeks to ensure this catastrophe of abuse will never happen in sports or any other industry again. But I remain paralyzed, unable to move my leading legs 
and often my broken body from my bed each day. You see, the damage caused was significant throughout my life. Unbeknownst to me, however, as I did not seek medical treatment for my aches and pains, as subconsciously I am now aware of the fear from which I operated as a result of the mistrust of doctors that I had repressed deep down. The damage continues to impact my relationship with my husband. It was only recently that I learned of certain sexual dysfunctions that I endure as a result of Nasser sexually abusing me. The intimacy that should be experienced in a normal relationship is one that I will never know due to my lack of trust and fear that accompany any intimate moment. My relationship is broken. Thankfully, my husband is not a monster like you and is willing to help me pick up the pieces of a shattered psyche that forever elude any semblance of normal. As far as my family relationships go, many of my relatives do not know about these assaults. I am too embarrassed to tell them. I'm afraid that they will say the same things that all critics can so easily mutter. Why didn't you tell anyone? Why didn't you tell us? It is the same answer that we all have. He manipulated us to think that what he was doing was not wrong. There was nothing to tell. Now there is, but the shame, guilt, and disgust prevent me from trusting my family, will support, trusting that my family will support me unconditionally. That is the extent of the damage. I have lost trust in everyone I know, including myself, and will forever doubt that I am truly cared for by anyone. You robbed us of our ability to love ourselves, to trust others, to rely on anyone. Why? Because we relied on you. We counted on you to not abuse our bodies, our minds, our souls. You have severely damaged entire generations of young women and their families. Families for whom I feel the utmost shame of myself and must present my sincerest, apolog sincerest apologies for not knowing for not questioning. My parents passed away quite a while ago, but for those young women whose families have been equally manipulated by this monster, my heart and undying devotion to address and eliminate this type of abuse will hopefully drive me into a place of forgiveness from you. I let you down. I am sorry for the pain that this has caused you. To all of the beautiful young women who this has impacted, please know I am sorry. There aren't words to tell you how truly sorry I am. To Nasser, you will not defeat us. We will slowly and painfully take back the power and control we relinquish to you. Your robbery of innocence will bring forth a fury that ensures that someone of your malevolence will never go unnoticed again. We will create and sustain the necessary change that guarantees that a young woman will never be made to feel the way we feel. Nevertheless, she persisted. As previously mentioned, I have suffered long-lasting physical symptoms, mostly back pain, that I reluctantly sought treatment for over the last several years as a result of the mistrust I have for doctors, especially male doctors. I recently began a physical therapy program as I attempt to heal myself emotionally and physically after discovering that I am a victim of sexual assault. I have a male physical therapist and there is not a second that goes by when I am in treatment that I am not afraid. I know that I must confront these fears in order for the healing process to begin, but that doesn't change the feeling of paralysis as he performs therapy, a feeling that I don't foresee receding anytime soon. I take some solace in knowing that this professional practices ethically, explaining procedures and obtaining consent ensuring that I am covered and draped to not expose any sensitive areas, and does everything to ensure that he follows protocol, something Nasser never did. Mental injuries, as a result of coming to terms with the idea of being a victim of sexual assault, as well as reliving the nightmares responsible for these feelings, are rather exhaustive. I alternate between feelings of overwhelming depression and hopelessness, to painful anxiety attacks that debilitate me in my daily life. I have committed to an undetermined length of treatment for counseling and psychological therapy to try to enhance my comprehension of this experience and the damage this revelation has caused. 
Most days, I have a hard time getting out of bed due to the weight of guilt and shame I now must face. My husband tries to help me by supporting my feelings and giving me space to process these horrible emotions. He certainly must feel a sense of rage toward you as your abuse robs us daily of productive, blissful life that most newly married partners enjoy. I can see the disappointment in his face as he tries every day to help me erase the pain and attempt to get through the day. I can even say that our most overwhelming emotion at this point is uncertainty. We don't know how this impacts us. How will this continue to rear its ugly head in our lives? To once again feel powerless as a result of your abuses and our revelation that what you did was wrong feels like your reach has a never-ending arm of destruction. It is only when we acknowledge this that we are able to take what's left of us at the end of an emotionally draining day, week, month, year, and hold each other in the solace in the knowledge that you will pay for your crimes, you will suffer endlessly. We will continue to work every day, every moment to take our power back. It will not be without challenge, without hardship, without pain, but we will fight to ensure that abuses like yours will never be perpetrated against another human being, not on our watches. So in essence, thank you. Thank you for destroying me. The phoenix will always rise from the ashes, and I can tell you with, the, with conviction of a million armies, the ones you sought to ruin will rise up and create change that will negate all of the wrongs you have caused. Our movement will not be stopped. So Nasser, thank you, even though you deserve not even the words I am writing now, and certainly do not deserve compassion or forgiveness, your wrongs will be made right. The impact Nasser's abuse has had on me is universal. As I was trying to finish my master's degree last year, as I first became aware that I was a victim of Nasser, I was unable to effectively concentrate in school and have been stricken with panic attacks that hindered my ability to do my best in school. As I tried to engage fully, I found myself unable to retain a present focus, and I was either haunted by your abuse in the past coming to terms with my newfound status as an assault victim, feeling rage each time I saw that you were denying your abuses, having to hide my emotional pain from my classmates, family, and professors, reading with each passing day just how many women you hurt, how many families you have broken, and lastly, learning that my heroes had to endure your disgusting, quote, treatments, unquote, all the while feeling a sense of guilt that is indescribable, as I must live with the knowledge that if I had been strong enough, you couldn't have hurt them. My heart aches every moment of every day, knowing that so many young women were abused by you and now have to live with the disabling pain of your abuses. As I now begin my career after school, I am still struck daily with a level of depression that is not easy to dispel. I experience severe anxiety that pervades my existence. I truly am lost trying to find purpose in daily living and am remiss to enjoy many of the activities I once enjoyed. I love to read, but now find that I only want to read about how miserable you are as I obsess on Google for any update. I love to dance, but now I find when I dance it reminds me of when I used to be happy dancing. Now I find difficulty concentrating to music, connecting to music, or anything joyful as my mind always seems to go to a dark place where you have taken everything away. I love to connect with people, but not anymore. I am afraid they will find me out, find out that I am broken, that I am responsible for breaking of others. I am a fraud. I love spending time with my husband. I love the thought of being intimate, but I am robbed of this reality as I am confronted with a novel source of confusion and desperation as I try to make sense of my dysfunction resulting from your abuse. Everything that I loved in life is no longer enjoyable as I reflect on the dark, hidden emotions your abuse has caused. My life forever altered by your despicable, deplorable, harmful, and hateful abuses. My mission has become to educate advocate for and empower the gymnastics community and will make this my number one priority for the rest of my life. 
As of right now, though, I am endlessly waiting for that life to begin. The pain you have inflicted on my psyche presents a seemingly immovable obstacle that stands waiting for me as I attempt to approach each new day. I am confident that I will face this insurmountable challenge as I work towards healing and will let this adversity spawn the flame that would be needed to affect profound and substantial change within this hurting, hurting community. Pain that you and your enablers at Michigan State University and USA Gymnastics caused and allowed to affect too many lives for far too long. All of you, Nasser, Michigan State University administration, coaches, trainers, deans, presidents, ADs, Board of Trustees, USA Gymnastics Presidents, USA Gymnastics Board Members, and USA Gymnastics Gyms that perpetuate a culture of abuse. You all, especially you, Larry Nasser, I hate saying your name, deserve a life filled with shame, humiliation, and disgrace as we survivors strive to take back what you all stole from us, never again. Nasser deserves the maximum sentence possible for the crimes he has committed against me and so many other innocent, beautiful women. Since we will all be imprisoned for the rest of our lives by his sexual abuse and the subsequent pain, humiliation, and guilt we will endure, Nasser deserves no less. He should not be able to enjoy another moment in his life as we will carry the weight of his abuse on our shoulders for the rest of our lives. It will impact our relationships. It will impact our well-being emotional and physical. It will impact our abilities to trust, to love, to empathize. He should never have the ability to experience this world as a free person, as he has forever imprisoned his victims in a world of shame, one so dark that only light we have to support each other, champion each other, and support one another's dreams. I am confident that we will move from victims to survivors and will endeavor and succeed in all we do to ensure that abuses of power like this are never allowed to occur again. Nasser should not be given the freedom to even know that he has empowered us as such. Victim 10. Thank you. And I don't know if Victim 10 is here or is listening online or will later read the transcript. But my message to her, and by the way, I'm doing this so that it's sentencing. I don't have to make a long statement, I'll make a statement, but I wanted to make sure I made an individual comment to each victim because it's important. And as to victim 10, I don't know if you're listening, I'm hoping that you are. Your status now is a strong, empowered survivor. You need to realize that I think that your words here today and what you wrote will help you get out of bed and begin a real healing process. Early on in what you said, and it's a common thread with everyone, every survivor had gone to defendant thinking he was some kind of hero. He is not a hero. Each survivor is a heroine, is superwoman, for going through this, for looking past it, for talking about it, for joining together. And victim 10 mentions that she's talking in front of strangers. I want to assure her she's not. It's a courtroom, a listening community of survivors, of caring individuals who are happy, to help her and to watch her get out of bed and be part of her marriage and the community. Speaking out, I'm hopeful will mend her. It certainly sounds like she's on that path. She talks about being paralyzed, being a paralyzed person. A paralyzed person could not have written that Thoughtful, thoughtful statement. She is no longer paralyzed. Victim 10, you're productive. We see it and want you to look past what you could have or should have done. 
you're valuable, you have a strong voice, and you stand united out of bed with your sister survivors. Thank you for being part of this process. Do we have one more? We do. We have a, a, a fairly quick one, I think, <coughs> identified and the statement she submitted to our office will be read by uh, Robin Liddell and her name is Taryn Look T-A-R-Y-N-L-O-O-K Thank you You may proceed when you're ready ma'am Thank you Your Honor I was 14 years old when Larry Nasser first treated me I had just won the gold medal for rhythmic gymnastics at the Junior Olympics. I will never forget walking into his office for the first time at Michigan State University. I was told I was lucky to get an appointment. When NASA walked me back into his treatment room, he pointed to the iconic photo of Carrie Strug right after her gold medal vault in the 96 Olympics. That's me, he said. I taped her up so she could do that. What happened after has haunted me for the rest of my life. It is a moment in time that is seared into my sense memory, one that causes recurring flashbacks, nightmares, and disassociative episodes. Larry Nasser sexually violated me under the guise of medical treatment. At the time of my abuse, I was representing the United States as a member of the USA Gymnastics National Team. I never wanted what happened in that room to be true. I ran away from it, buried it, and numb myself through self-destructive behavior. I struggled with suicidal ideation, self-harm, incredible low self-esteem, panic attacks, severe depression, and PTSD. It has had a deep and long-lasting impact on my life. Last November, I finally came to terms with the truth of what happened on that day. He did not, quote, treat me for lower back pain. He sexually abused me. I was still a child. I wanted to end my life, and in doing so, end the insurmountable shame, grief, and pain that came flooding back. Yet, I am not the only one. The extent of Larry Nash's damage is unprecedented. There are hundreds of victims at the hands of this man. I stand in solidarity with other women who came forward to condemn what has happened. Larry Nasser stole our innocence. He violated our bodies. My childhood was stolen from me. Shame on USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University for allowing a child predator to continually abuse young women and girls for decades. Had his first victims been believed back in 1997, I would not be a victim today. Had they taken proper recourse and action, I would not be a victim today. It is beyond unconscionable that so many women had to come forward before Larry Nassar's behavior was even addressed. These, inst these institutions that employed and protected him for all these years must be held accountable. We demand justice and accountability. It is time. Thank you. As to Karen Luck, justice and accountability, I can give you at sentencing. It is very clear from what you've said and from what others have said that defendant used Olympic winners, letters, his posters. <clears throat> as a plan, scheme, design to violate athletes to gain trust. It's all part of a bigger plan. And it's a shame shame on defendant for using those prizes as enticements to violate young women. <coughs> His book earned a gold medal already, but she has earned gold medal from me as well in terms of her golden words. She stands united with the rest of the survivors. 
And she again adds that piece to the puzzle of how someone can be so manipulative. No one should feel, and Ms. Look should not feel like a victim. She should feel like a hero for her words, and she should get rid of the guilt. So many people overlooked what was going on. She's not overlooked it. She's become part of a strong, united voice that's saying no more. And I honor her for doing that and all of the survivors. And for today, there are reasons that I won't go into at this moment, but we need to conclude. And we will resume tomorrow at 9 a.m. And I thank you all for being here. That's all for this record.